<laughs> hello, 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 my friends. Let's see here. Let me get this going. There we go. We are live. Are we live? Yes, we're live. Hello, 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 my friends. My name is Jill Osborne. I am the president and founder of the Interstitial Cystitis Network. It is Sunday, October 17th, and it is time for our national IC support group meeting. My purpose in the, doing these meetings is to make you so strong, so knowledgeable, so informed that no one can mess with you again. I don't want anybody to be able to demean you, insult you, suggest that this is all in your head because it's not all in your head. It is not all in your head. I see is real. Bladder pain syndrome is real. It is treatable. Uh, but for many of you, it's not your bladder in the first place, that your bladder is being victimized by something else in your pelvis. And God, you know, the, real the reality is, my friends, is that we have had patients taking Elmeron and other bladder therapies for years, never getting better. And now, of course, they're dealing with retinal disease. Some of them are dealing with retinal disease and things like that uh, from the medication itself. But there's an important lesson here. The important lesson here is if a bladder therapy isn't working for you, you need to stop, take a step back, revisit the diagnosis, and let's make sure we haven't missed anything. I mean, like seriously, if you're following the IC diet, if you're still getting flares, if you are not improving, if you're, but most importantly, if your bladder is normal when they look at it and they're, they're like going, I don't know what's wrong with you. You look fine. And you're going, but I'm up all night peeing. And it's like, hey, there's nothing there. You must have this in, this weird disease called interstitial cystitis. And it's very, very important that you stop what you're doing and take a step back and revisit the diagnosis. And that's not just me saying that. That's the American Urology Association saying that and their guidelines for IC. We don't want you to be doing a therapy for 20, 30 years and not getting better. If you're not improving within a year or two, at the most, something's wrong. Could they have missed something? And it is quite possible. Hi, Deborah. Hello, Sue. Thank you. Uh, uh, you're hanging in there, huh? Um, Ann says, is IC mistaken for VA vaginal atrophy? No, no. Va vaginal atrophy is certainly something that can, can cause bladder sensitivity. It's not mistaken for it because vaginal atrophy is very easy for them to see. They see marked changes in your skin that they don't see in quote a bladder disease, you know, like a bacterial infection, something like that. All right, here, hold on a sec. Now it's very stormy here. We got a whole bunch of light changing. So the light's changing all over the place right now. So creating a good environment for video right now, is a little bit challenging. All righty then. So um, I want to talk about something. So when I do these meetings, I usually do a 30 minute lecture and then I do a, I'll take your questions as long as you have them. We might go into Zoom. We might not. We just see how the wind is, how the wind is blowing at that time. If somebody wants to do it, if not, that's fine. Um, so I'm happy to be here as long as I can possibly be here. Right. And let's just hope, you know, I've done two live events now where we've had earthquakes. <laughs> so I was like, okay, you never know. You just got to take every day for what it is, right? You just have to take every day for what it is. Um, I want to, I just want to talk briefly about something that I, that I, I witnessed this morning that I'm very, very disturbed about. And that is that, um, you know, we, we know that the internet is uh, a wonderful educator. It allows us to have these meetings. It allows us to bring the best resources in the world into your home or into your office. That was my original goal in building the IC network 28 years ago, especially for those of you who are not near a major IC research center and you're out in the boonies and you just, you're alone and you just wonder, you know, you can't find a doctor that's going to be healthy because you're geographically limited. And so the internet has some absolutely wonderful blessings. But the internet also has, has also brought out the worst in people. And we see this in, in almost every facet of the internet. We see this 
uh, certainly on Facebook, on Twitter. Uh, you see it. I mean, you, we've all seen it. And, you know, I have a really thick skin because I've been doing this a long time. I started the first website for IC. I ran the first support forum for IC well before Facebook. I've already seen the down, down dark, and dirty of people. And I always believe that when you're in a support group, you have to come in with an attitude of forgiveness. Because we don't know what somebody else is going through. We don't know if they've been up all night. We don't know if they haven't had a good night's sleep in a month, much less a year. And it is very, very important that when you are interacting with other IC patients online, that you must understand that pain has a way of modulating what we're hearing and what we're saying. So if, for example, you make a post somewhere about something that you've gone through, let's just say you had a bad doctor's appointment, the doctor told you it was all in your head, you've come onto Facebook, you're here to get support, and somebody criticizes you and somebody ha cops an attitude with you. Hey, Jill, maybe it was your fault. You know, maybe you're just too arrogant, right? And um, this didn't happen. I'm protecting the anonymity of the people that this happened to. But whoever made that post seeking support got some supportive messages, but they got some mean messages too. You know, we once had a case of a man with interstitial cystitis who went into a Facebook group online, IC support group, and he was kicked out. Why? Because the group leader didn't believe that men got IC. He was devastated. He came here for support. For God's sake, people, he came here for support. And you kicked him out? Because he was a man? No. No. People who come online for support need support. They don't need your criticism. They don't need an attitude. You don't know what they've gone through. You don't know if perhaps their mother has COVID and maybe might be dying. And so it is important that we practice forgiveness whenever you're online in a support group meeting. And that is you forgive someone who might say something they don't really mean to say, that's a pain talking. And you need to forgive yourself for when you have those moments, when you lash out. You know, I have lashed out too. I have lashed out mostly to my mother and to my sister. Never consciously, never consciously. My mother, who is, I care for now, who is eating breakfast right now, who has... Never in her life said a mean word about anybody to anything, to any, I mean, I've never heard her say a mean word. She's filled with love. And I am somewhat ashamed that she has seen the worst of me. But I have made sure that I have apologized. I try not to hurt those people around me. But sometimes pain speaks and finds a way to come out. That's why it's very important that you come to meetings like this because you can vent to me. I don't want you to vent to a family member. I don't want you to vent to somebody online who might also be suffering. If you need to vent, that's what support groups are for, potentially, or your own personal friends. That's what they're for, potentially. All right. So just please understand that when somebody's coming into a support group, uh, support group forum, uh, on Facebook, don't beat them up. Please don't beat them up. For all you know, they may be hanging on by a thread and we don't want you to be the person who pushes them over the edge. All right. Practice forgiveness, my friends. Practice forgiveness. Now, now y'all know last week we did the announcement for the bladder regeneration study for Wake Forest University and Dr. Robert Evans. Well, the response has been wonderful. I have about 20 of you so far who I've now been into contact with. Uh, here, Sue says, kindness and compassion are free. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
So I put about 20, 25 of you into personal contact with Dr. Robert Evans. He is that they are already starting to interview some of you. And so this is fantastic. For those of you who don't know this, you know, one of the dreams for the last 25 years, 30 years, patients have said is, I want a new bladder. But of course, we don't do bladder transplants. They don't do bladder transplants. Um, what they have done in the past is something called an augmentation. For those of you with super, super, super small bladders, where the bladder is really scarred and shrunken and cannot expand to hold urine, they used to do, they do something called an augmentation where they would take a piece of intestine and shape and attach it to the bladder and increase the blad the bladder capacity. But bowel tissue is never meant to be bladder tissue, and there are kind of long term challenges with that. So kind of the best case scenario is if they can make a piece of tissue that's from you, that they can then attach to your bladder that could potentially expand your bladder capacity. Now, we have known now for about the last 15 years, Wake Forest University's Institute of Regenerative Medicine, they were the first in the world to create a bladder or create tissue that would help a bladder. And it was fascinating what they did. They would take a deep tissue biopsy all the way through the bladder of whoever it was they wanted to care for. Uh, they take a deep tissue all the way through. They catch every layer of the bladder, the, the bladder lining, the smooth muscle behind the bladder, et cetera, et cetera. Then they would separate those cells and then they would grow them out. They would grow them out separately. Imagine cells growing on a Petri dish, right? I mean, it's pretty interesting. So here's your own cells growing. You got your smooth muscle of your bladder wall, and then you got your bladder lining. Pretty exciting. Then, of course, they have to come up with a shape. We don't want a flat layer of tissue. We need, we need a shape that kind of resembles what a bladder would look like. It's called a scaffold. So they you created a scaffold that of tissue that's not harmful to the bladder at all, basic, I mean, to the body at all, basically dissolves over time. So they created this scaffold and then they put your, the uh, smooth muscle of the bladder on the outside of the scaffold and they put the, uh, the bladder lining on the inside of the scaffold. And then they watched it grow over the scaffold until what? Wow, look at this. We have something that looks like a bladder. It's kind of like the shape of a bladder. And in the early days, uh, they actually transplanted these into children with spina bifida who were having issues with their bladder. And they were successful. Of course, one of the challenges here is now here you've, you've got bladder tissue and you've got it in, a, in what looks like a bladder, kind of resembles a bladder, but there's no blood vessels. Where's the blood vessels? I mean, all skin needs blood, right? So what they would do is they would harvest a piece, of, it's a part of your omentum. I think that's what it's called on the inside of the bladder wall. Am I on the inside of the abdominal cavity? Okay, here, hold on a sec. My virus checker on my computer is popping up. All right. Um, they would wrap this artificial bladder with this new blood vessel tissue. And by golly, eventually that tissue ended up being really nicely perfused with blood and oxygen and nutrition. So again, this was like 15 years ago, they were implanting it in spina bifida patients. And then if I remember correctly, I thought that they sold the rights off to it. I, I'm not sure on that. I, that's what I heard because then it kind of stopped. The next thing that the Institute for Regenerative Medicine started doing was they started creating mini organs for research purposes. So they could harvest some tissue and instead of creating a human sized bladder, they would take a little tiny, tiny bladder, right? Or a little tiny other you know, kidney, whatever. And they could you potentially use that for research studies. So that was pretty exciting. Well, now uh, last week, a week ago, eight days ago, Robert Evans reached out to me and said, we are now at this stage where we are ready to do this on adult humans, you know, um, and same thing, what they do, what they, except in this case, rather than taking kind of a deep punch biopsy, they're taking a one to two inch square out of somebody's bladder, separating the pieces, growing them out, attaching them to a scaffold. And what they're going to do is they're going to use that tissue to increase their bladder capacity. They're not going to completely replace the bladder, but they're going to greatly expand that bladder capacity. Now, what's exciting about that is because it's your tissue, there's just like 
the chance of rejection is tiny, right? It's, it's extremely exciting. So again, uh, so the, on our website, icnetwork.org, uh, I have the full announcement. Uh, basically, you have to have a bladder capacity of 150 cc's or less, um, and you have to have increased urinary frequency. Um, we're get, getting, a, I'm a little bit confused on, on the pain. What he said in, in his email to me was he could not accept pain patients who had a big bladder capacity. It has to be, if you have pain, you still have to have a small bladder capacity. So if you are interested in learning more about this, especially for those of you who have tiny, tiny, tiny bladders, please reach out to me, icnetwork at meth.com, and I will give you Dr. Robert Evans' personal contact information so that you can reach out to his clinic and talk to them about that research study. So this, again, cutting edge stuff, absolutely cutting edge stuff. Um, and then, so yesterday, <laughs> well, like, here's the deal. You know what? When I was younger, in my 30s, when I started the IC Network, I could sit here for hours. You give me a challenge, I'd work through it. Man, you give me a problem, something complex, I would work through it. I could sit here for hours. One of the things that's happened as I've gotten older is that I want to fix, I want to figure stuff out quickly. My attention my patience level in solving problems is really low. <laughs> like I was trying to, I was trying to play a new a, a new game with some friends last night. I just couldn't get it to work in my on my computer for like twenty minutes. I said, "All right, guys, I'm not going to hold you back. I'll see you later." And I still kind of feel bad that I didn't tough through it, but I my patience level is really low. But anyway, I am now working on some new TikToks for IC. And my first TikTok is going to be, what are the five worst drinks that you can have if you have a damaged bladder wall, IC subtype 100 lesions, IC subtype 2 bladder wall driven? What are the five worst drinks that you can have? All right. And I want to see if you can figure out the number one drink. But let me let me give them. So, so number five, orange juice or lemonade, right? Number four, tea, green tea, black tea. Number three, coffee, right? Number two, we call it the acid bomb, cranberry juice, right? But what do you think the number one, the number one worst drink that um, somebody somebody could drink is if you've got bladder wall driven or hunter's lesions. I'd love to see your answers here. Does anybody have a guess? What could be worse than coffee? What could be worse than cranberry juice? Hi, Sierra. Hello, Zelda. Oh, not a problem, hun. Not a problem. I, I you know, life is complex for all of us. Um, hi, Jay. Hi, Barbara. Oh. <laughs> Sierra says a soda. Oh, did I forget to put soda in there? Okay. Well, it's not soda and it's not alcohol. Oh, what did I do? Oh, you know what? I had coffee and tea in the same group on the TikTok. Okay. So replace tea with soda. Okay. But that's still not the number one worst drink. What's the worst drink? And no, it's not alcohol. Hi, Deborah. Hi, Su Suzanne. Hello, Anne. Hello, Kathy. I have a chronic UTI for three months and now I have incontinence. That is not good, honey. I'm so sorry to hear that. What kind of UTI do you have? Have they identified the bacteria yet? Hello, Kristen. Hello, Sue. Kayleen. Kayleen says she has good news and bad news. Crap. You have bladder stones? What the hell? Oh my God. Oh my God. Wow. They think that your endometriosis has perforated your bladder wall and it might have made a microscopic hole, which is causing your chronic UTIs. Holy honey. Girl, everybody right now, please say a prayer for Kayleen. Kayleen, girl, 
your journey is rough. You're going to come out of it in the end and you're going to help other people. But right now, I understand your heartache. Vicky says, it's hard to catch a person's true meaning with text. True. Sakina says, my husband just developed IC, which is why I joined this support group. I hear what you're saying about men with IC. There's ignorance and stigma. Almost as many men as women have it. It's often misdiagnosed. So Sakina, now this is, I'm going to say something that's pretty controversial. There's some people who disagree with me, but I'm going to give you my personal experience of working with men for the last 28 years. My support group uh, Icy Redwood Empire, which I started in Northern California in 1993, was filled with men. I had the most men in the country in my support group and a lot of pharmacists. And I, I was a pharmacologist. So we used to all gather together after our meetings and just talk, you know, it's like, okay, were you ever exposed to benzene? Were you ever exposed to this or that? You know, we were all back then trying to figure out what could have triggered this. Um, I'm going to tell you that in my personal experience, working with men on the phone for the last 25 years, especially in the last five to 10 years, the great majority of men have had some sort of physical trauma. The great majority, not all of them. Uh, some of them have some heredity involved, some genetics involved, some have UTI, some might even have cancer. But it's very important that you not walk away from or 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 just ignore the concept of physical injury or trauma, especially if, for example, your husband was an athlete. Um, I've shared the story of a Hawaii Ironman that I worked with, a Denver Bronco football player that I worked with, who both suddenly developed, quote unquote, icy-like symptoms. In fact, were diagnosed with IC eventually, only to discover after the fact that they had terrible pelvic floor muscle injuries. So if your husband was a motorcycle rider, a bike rider, if he was a steel, I had two guys, very interesting, within a week apart, an older man and a younger man, both worked in steel mills. And the challenge with their work is they had to squat and bend over for hours at, at a day, right? And they both developed, quote unquote, IC. And they both had extremely tight dysfunctional pelvic floor muscles. Ian, hello, Ian. All right. So, you know, not quite yet. We're still looking for what is the single worst beverage you can drink if you have hundreds lesions or bladder while driven. Oh, you guys, nobody's gotten it. What? How can you not get this? It's not Coke or Diet Coke. Nope. Not soda, not alcohol, not, not carbonated drinks. Although you're kind of close, I'll give you a hint. It comes in a can. It can come in a big can, or most often it comes in a little tiny can. Is that a clue? Anybody got it? it I'll, I'll do it. It's perfectly in theme with Halloween coming up. Is that a clue? Not apple juice. Laura got her PEA. Awesome. All right, guys. Energy drinks. Energy drinks. Think monster energy drinks, right? The little energy drinks. Holy hell. I mean, massive acid, massive caffeine. Yeah, it's coffee, but it's a little bit more than coffee because they, they can be flavored and stuff like that. So the single worst thing you can be drinking if you have a damaged bladder is an energy drink. How you guys feeling today? How's everybody doing? Like I'm, I didn't, I mean, like I slept well last night. I had a really funny dream before I woke up. Um, Zelda goes, oh, energy drinks makes sense. I know, right? And, and if you ever compare the IC diet with the IBS diet, there's a wonderful website called Help for IBS. And, and kind of the, the goal of both diets is to make sure that we're not provoking nerves and triggering nerves. And they too, their number one worst drink is absolutely an energy drink. Okay, Kristen, I was just diagnosed with cancer. It's either uterine or endometrial. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. And on top of it, I have a severe UTI, probably because I thought my IC was flaring up. I will need a total hysterectomy and maybe radiation and removal of lymph nodes. I'm worried how all this is going. All right, girl. Now, listen, I went through this four years ago. I, same thing. And it was a six month journey of 
neg uh, scary biopsy after scary biopsy after scary biopsy. And then eventually they went, yep, we think you have uterine cancer. You need to have a total hysterectomy immediately. And I did have a total hysterectomy. And it was the only time in history that I've actually reached out to my medical board for, for personal advice, right? I'd never done that in 20 years. I'd never asked them for personal advice, but I was just like you. And I, I said this to my gynecologist. I said, I don't, I don't care about the cancer. For God's sake, don't hurt my bladder. I don't want to go back 20 years. I've been pain free with my bladder for years now, for like 10 years. And I, the last thing I wanted to do was hurt my bladder. And that one of the things they do when they do the total hysterectomy is they do a very, very quick, very, very brief hydrodistension to make sure they haven't hurt your bladder in any way. Okay. So Kristen, there's a fabulous website called Hister Sisters, histersisters.com. You need to go over there and you need to sign up and they have, they talk all about the different te surgical techniques. Uh, probably they're going to end up doing um, a laparoscopic assisted total vaginal hysterectomy or a da Vinci robotic, basically that you end up with these little tiny incisions on your belly and they take everything out through your vagina. Um, and they may, depending upon who's doing it, they, they may, if you have an onco oncological gynecologist or gynecological onco oncologist, is that correct? They, they may also take some, uh, lymph nodes too, to take a look at them. So what the medical board told me is that they said that we've really never seen any IC patient having a hysterectomy report a, a serious worsening of their IC symptoms. Um, and every single one of them said, you need to have this done. Like I was prepared not to have it done. I did not, I did not want to hurt my bladder. Every single one of them said, do it. And then they all said laparoscopic assisted total vaginal hysterectomy or da Vinci, least traumatic, easiest to do, best recovery. And so that's what I did. That's what I did. And, um, uh, if you want to talk offline about what that's like and going through that, I would be happy to walk you through uh, what I went through and how I prepared for it and what the recovery was like. You know, the recovery, especially the first week afterwards, is, is challenging. It's, it's rather shocking that it's an outpatient procedure. Um, like I was literally on the way home 90 minutes after leaving the operating room. I was stunned absolutely stunned. Um, and so, you know, it's it, the first week, especially first two weeks are going to be challenging. It's going to be a lot of things you're going to need to do. So Kristen, call me, call me, uh, come on over to our website. Our, my phone number's right there. And um, I'd be happy to talk to you more about it. You got this girl. You got this. Is Brita, why is Brita water filter not good? Because a really good water filters take out too many minerals and they take out the pH balancing minerals. And so what happens is you end up with acid water. Uh, and so generally filters like the Brita water filter produce acidic water that can be irritating. Now I saw a message that already went off my screen about somebody having an appointment with Dr. Evans about something, but um, I couldn't catch it. So whoever that was, please do that back. Angie on YouTube, you guys were simulcasting on YouTube. If I'm looking over here, I'm looking at the YouTube chat. If I'm looking over here, I'm looking at the Facebook chat. Angie says, hello, Jill. I just got my IC diagnosis two weeks ago, but I was in the ER due to a bladder hemorrhage. Holy crap. Okay, I'm going to try not to swear today. Fourth in a year um, with a UTI culture of 25,000, 49,000 49, E. coli. The pain is bad. <sighs> So Angie, um, you are technically excluded from a diagnosis of IC if you have active infection. That's what the American Urology Association says, that you are excluded from a diagnosis of IC if you test positive for infection. Now, the fact that your bladder is hemorrhaging is deeply concerning, and we have to understand why it's hemorrhaging. Is it hemorrhaging because of the infection? Or is it hemorrhaging because you have Hunter's lesions? And that is going to be a very, very important question that your doctor is going to have to answer for you is, you know, when I think of, of UTI and infecting the bladder and causing, causing bleeding, I don't really think of a hemorrhage. Um, when I think of a Hunter's lesion, 
it's known for hemorrhaging so severely, it's, it, they call it the waterfall effect. It looks like a blood waterfall. So that's going to be a very important question for you to ask your doctors is what is bleeding? Is Am I bleeding because I have a hunter's lesion or am I bleeding because I have a UTI? And hopefully, girl, you say the pain is bad. I, I cannot, I'm sure the pain is bad for you. And I hope that they've given you some pain meds. They haven't given you some pain meds, maybe some azo bladder pain relief tablets that you can get at a local drugstore might be a little bit helpful. Hey, hi, Amy. Uh, what about spring water? Spring water is fine. Spring water is good. Lisa got it. Lisa got it. Energy drinks. Yes. Laura says, got my PEA yesterday. So excited to start it. Awesome. Kayleen says, my therapist says, do either become an advocate for mental health or women's health? Good girl, you're going to be a beast. When you do that, you are going to change the lives of thousands of patients for the better. No doubt about it. Angie said, I was diagnosed before the hemorrhage. No hunter's lesions found. I've had a history of bladder hemorrhage without UTIs. I'm afraid of cancer. <sighs> You have a history of bladder hemorrhage? What? What's bleeding? Man, you know, I, your kidneys could be bleeding, maybe. I mean, that would be my, you know, guys, you, you all know how I feel about testing, that I don't like guesses, I like facts, and there comes a time when it's important to let somebody look in your bladder. If you're bleeding, if you're hemorrhaging, by, go by golly, they need to look in your bladder and try to figure out what is bleeding. They say, yeah, but where in your bladder? Is it a wound? I mean, what's bleeding? That's baffling. Amy says, Dr. Evans put me on fentanyl 18 years ago. Mm, yeah. That, well, back then, 18 years ago, we were told that fentanyl was safe. They were all told fentanyl was safe. It's good. And it's certainly a solid pain meds. Ah, you also have history of kidney stones. Hmm. But your kidneys are fine as far as your ultrasound. Well, if you're still bleeding today, I, I mean, to me, the, the general rule of thumb is if you're peeing bright red blood or passing blood clots or your, or your toilet is pink with pink urine, that is called to your doctor to get, because that is considered abnormal and needs to be explored more thoroughly. They can do something called a urine cytology test where you pee into a cup and they look for cancer markers in that cup. And if that comes back positive, then they would do a bladder biopsy. But if that comes back negative, then that's, uh, that's good news. But you're absolutely right. They really do need to try to figure this out for you. That's very unusual. A healthy bladder, healthy skin does not bleed. There's a problem somewhere. They got to figure it out. And you got to be the squeaky wheel. Lisa says, alcohol made me TP a ton yesterday. Kristen said, I believe my dad had IC as well. He suffered so much. You know, my dad, who would be 99 um, in less than a month, uh, he has had IC-like symptoms for the last two years now. We're really struggling with him being able to sleep through the night. He can't do any coffee. He can't do any anything tomato. Um, uh, so it's we're always working on trying to make sure that he can try to get to sleep. He also can't bend over. If he bends over, he gets GERD. So he can't make the bed like he used to be able to. I've got to I've got to make the bed, and I, he keeps bending over and getting GERD. And it's like, stop, call me, I'll do it for you. Grapefruit juice, pineapple juice, pineapple juice, tomato juice. Those are all bad. Kristen said monster drinks. Yes. Mary says, what causes inflammation in the bladder? What is the best thing to help it? I know my bladder wall is inflamed. Well, Mary, that's a really good point. So, you know, there's been a lot of IC research over the last 20 years, a lot of it done by our own National Institutes of Health. The current IC and chronic prostatitis research group is called the MAP Research Network. There, so there have been um, study after study after study looking at bladder biopsies to try to understand what's going on in the bladder wall. And here's what they found. The only patients with inflammation are patients with Hunter's lesions. 
A hunter's lesion is considered the worst form of IC. It's a big bloody wound in the bladder. And when you biopsy the center of that lesion, man, you find biological warfare happening. You find massive inflammation, massive inflammation. Um, but for the rest of us who have IC subtype 2, bladder wall-driven estrogen atrophy, or IC subtype 2, chemical cystitis, or IC subtype 3, pelvic floor, IC subtype 4, pudendal neuralgia, even IC subtype 5, central sensitization, there's no, there's, we don't have inflammation in our bladders. Really, what the science has found is the people with the worst inflammation in their bladders are Hunter's lesions. So what is inflammation? Inflammation is the equivalent of a biological war. It is your body mobilizing your white blood cells to, to fight an enemy. There's something happening there. There's an inflammatory response happening there. And we now have a clue as to why that could be happening with some Hunter's lesion patients, because researchers in Europe were the first to discover that patients with Hunter's lesions may have a virus. They may have a viral infection in their bladder. And in fact, Angie, this is important for you to know too. You know, there is a virus that we all have called the polyoma virus, poly polyoma BK, polyoma JC. Polyoma virus is part of the human biome slash virome. It is normally passive and quiet in our bodies, but it does get turned on if we are immune compromised. And what happens then is that it develops a really significant wound in the bladder. There's active viral infection in the bladder wall. And that is known again for bleeding profusely. So back 30 years ago, when the HIV AIDS crisis was happening, these patients were severely immune compromised Many of them had hemorrhagic cystitis from a polyoma infection that got basically turned on. And we also know that patients who are on immune suppressant drugs, it might get turned on there. And now, of course, we have COVID. We have COVID-associated cystitis. So COVID in some patients um, triggers a massive inflammatory response called the cytokine storm. And it is the cytokine storm that does so much damage to the tissue. So the people who have passed away from COVID have massive tissue damage from this massive inflammatory reaction. Well, that inflammatory reaction is, is reaching the bladder in some of them. And so some patients have developed what we call de novo cystitis. What that means is new. They have no previous history of any bladder issues. And after COVID, especially moderate to severe COVID, they walk out with what feels like I see massive frequency, urgency, and in some cases, pain. That's COVID associated cystitis. And we have also, they have also found COVID viral infections in the bladder itself. But these are in the patients who are the most severe. In uh, some of the patients who have passed away, massive viral infection throughout the body. Okay, so viral infections are possible. So, what's the best thing that you can do to help reduce inflammation? You know, um, um, we're working on that right now. Uh, there are there are some ingredients that have a very nice anti-inflammatory effect. Um, I'm working with somebody, I can't say too much about, about it right now, but I do believe that we are going to have a flare T. Um, I'm pretty excited about it. They already have a prototype. It's working for patients with really severe bladder irritation from UTI. And I'm gonna see if we can adapt that for IC and create a calming and soothing herbal tea for patients having IC flares who have, are IC subtype one hundred lesions or IC subtype two. Yes, Lisa, you did say energy drinks. Yes, I just didn't see it. Carla says, I'm sitting here on a heating pad. Okay, so it's, a, it's fairly unusual to be sitting on a heating pad. Normally we have the heating pad over our lower belly. So why are you sitting on it, Carla? Susan says, I'm not doing well. I'm bleeding and passing clots from an area in my bladder that was cauterized, not in the hospital yet, but this is the sixth time since February. Susan, honey, listen, 
if you're bleeding every day and you're passing clots every day, that doctor needs to see you immediately. There's a problem. Uh, that's, that's not normal. I would consider that an urgent, urgent situation. I got something on my, my glasses here. Um, what does your doctor say about it, Susan? What does your doctor say? Carla says, I've started using a, a gummy with CBD and CBG. It's helped with my pain and pressure. Have you heard of CBG? No. What is CBG? I don't know what that is. It's supposed to help inflammation in addition to pain. Sounds good to me. Loretta Lee, post-total hysterectomy helped my bladder. There you go. Here's another person who did well with a hysterectomy. My bladder was not damaged by my hysterectomy at all. My pelvic floor muscles on, it, on the other sand really had a bit of a challenge recovering from that trauma. Allison said, what is the best water? What is the best water for IC? Just a simple spring water, just a real spring water, not a Dasani, not a water that's drawn from a city system. I'm, I'm talking more Arrowhead, if you're on the West Coast, Crystal Geyser, you want a good spring water. Sandy said, and Sandy, what I said is that some of the water filtering systems are too good and they take out too many minerals, the minerals that balance the pH. And so what happens then is the water that comes out the other end can be a, a bit acidic, which can be irritating. Anne says, I'm afraid to use the estrogen cream. Why, honey? Why are you afraid? I use my estrogen cream a couple times a week. If I don't use it, my urethra starts to get quite irritated. I love my estrogen cream. Okay, Carla's saying Moonwalker CBD cream. Carla, can you email me that information? You know what? Let me write that down. Is it hemp or, or medical marijuana? If it's hemp, we can send it across state lines. If it's medical marijuana, we can't. And that sucks. What is it called? Moonwalker. I got to look into this. CBD gummy. Uh, you guys always give me so much work when I do these meetings. <laughs> Zelda says, I love my estrogen cream too. Just used it today. Lisa says, reactive arthritis is my latest diagnosis. Bladder, eyes, and knee. It's very rare. It took over a year to get diagnosed. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. I'm the only patient my doctor has ever had. His dad, also a doctor. Hmm. You're about to have a gastroplexus nerve block. Oh, honey, I hope that that goes well. I really do. Good luck. Mary says, I have breast cancer and they wanted me to do immunotherapy and radiation. Will this hurt my bladder? You know, generally, hun, the, the radiation that damages the bladder are the, is the radiation that's done down in the pelvis. So if you were had ovarian cancer or prostate cancer, that's where the radiation can damage. So the radiation done for your breast cancer is really probably not going to do anything to your, to your bladder. Although you certainly want to talk to your oncologist about that just to double check me because I'm not supposed to give medical advice. It's not my job to give medical advice. It is my job to educate you, inform you, and then kick you in the butt and get you back to your doctor asking questions, right? Um, so um, there is one form of... Uh, oral chemotherapy that is quite well known to irritate the bladder. Um, here, hold on a sec. But uh, they now have a fix for that. It's a metabolite of the specific form of chemotherapy. I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. They can give you a medication that will turn off that metabolite. Donna said, I had a total hysterectomy and I had a lot of bladder pain. So I was told to use hormone cream that caused more pain. Should I keep trying to use the cream? You know, <sighs> Here, hold on a sec. Give me, give me a quick moment here. Facebook is, I mean, YouTube's being weird. All right, let's go back to this. Donna had a total hysterectomy, so I had a lot of bladder pain. So I was told to use hormone cream, but that caused more pain. Should I keep trying? So Donna, here's the challenge. I want you to think about the bladder for a moment. The bladder is the only organ, the urinary tract is the only bodily system designed to hold toxic waste and designed to carry and relieve toxic waste from your body, right? 
So urine is body waste. Urine contains ammonia and urea and lots of chemical byproducts, the chemicals you're exposed to, cigarette smoke and all that sort of stuff. So how can the bladder hold ammonia for hours at a time and not get damaged? Well, the answer is, is that your bladder is like your mouth. It's a hollow organ covered with a really thick coating of mucus. We call it the mighty mucus. And the purpose of the mucus is to serve as a barrier. It's a barrier. It makes it difficult for anything irritating in your urine to reach the more fragile cells of your bladder. And it also helps resist infection. It makes it harder for bacteria to reach those cells to infect those cells. Unfortunately, that mighty mucus is estrogen dependent. So when you're young and you have lots of estrogen, you have lots of mucus and you can get away with stuff. But when you're older, you have much less estrogen, you have much less mucus, thus your bladder's ability to defend itself is now compromised. That's not a disease. That is called estrogen atrophy or the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. So when people talk about therapy, a lot of people say, well, what can I do to heal my bladder? Well, if you give those cells estrogen, they start to produce mucus again. Topical estrogen is considered remarkably safe because the estrogen stays in the skin. It is not known for reaching the bloodstream in any great quantity and circulating throughout the body. So the safety of topical estrogen is now well, well documented. The challenge here is it hurt you. And we have to figure out why. Uh, if your skin was already really, 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 really dry and you put any chemical on it, it's going to burn. So the first several times that you use topical estrogen on your skin, on your vulva, in your vagina, there is a very, very, very good chance it's going to burn. But your skin immediately starts using that estrogen. And so you should see that burning slowly declining over time. It took about two weeks for the burning to go away for me. The first time I used my estrogen cream, it burned for maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes. It was like, oh, I don't know if I like this or not. But within two weeks, it was like a little warm puff of air, like, poof, and it was gone within seconds. Now, if I don't use my estrogen cream for a week or two, the burning comes right back. And so that burning really is more about your skin. That's a, that tells you the quality and health of your skin. So for many women, you've got to ride yourself through that superficial burning of, that, of, of the estrogen cream to get through that. However, um, Premarin, which is a very common um, medication, you all have heard about Premarin. It's extremely expensive. It comes from pregnant horses, pregnant mare urine, Premarin. Premarin is well known to cause a lot of, a lot more burning. And that's because it has a lot of extra preservatives in it. So you could be reacting to chemicals in the topical estrogen. So Premarin is kind of known for causing the worst irritation. Estrace, another brand name, not nearly as bad. Many women get through estrace, no problem. But my doctor, for example, he goes, Jill, we already know you're super sensitive. I'm not going to give you any of that. I am sending you to the Women's International Pharmacy where we're going to get a preservative-free estrogen cream. So my estrogen cream is propylene glycol free. Let me go get it. Hold on, because I just got a new bottle. Oh, hold on. Oh, I'm so stiff. Now, these guys, I'm not paid by the Women's International Pharmacy. I am just telling you my personal experience. Oh, wait, <laughs> I brought the wrong one. I brought the box with my applicators. Hold on. So this is a compounded estradiol cream. Ooh, thank you. Somebody sent me stars. I really appreciate that. So C-estradiol, 
uh, paraben free cream. So over the years, it said propylene glycol free cream and stuff like that. But the current iteration is, I don't know if you can see that. You can't see that, can you? Paraben free cream, right? All right. So anyway, the other advantage of using a compounding pharmacy is it's much cheaper. So Primarin can cost you $220, $250 for three months supply, 45 bucks. If you're wondering what I'm drinking, this is our pumpkin spice rubos herbal tea that is perfect for IC patients. No acid. You can get this in the IC network store. So if you love your pumpkin spice lattes, but you can, you're not doing coffee, obviously, this, this rubos tea from Harney and Sons is incredible. It's so good. It's right here. So let's get into the season. It's best time of the year for those of us who love all things fall. So you can find this in the IC Network store. I, uh, just go to our website, icnetwork.org, and click on the store. Carolina said, I had a total hysterectomy six months ago for endometriosis and adenomyosis. I still have bladder spasms. Had recently developed nerve type pain in the lower back. Could be connected to the hysterectomy. I'm eating. I'm waiting to see my pelvic floor physio. So Carolina, I had 10 months of, uh, of levator ani spasms after mine. It felt like there was a hand up my vagina grabbing onto where my cervix used to be and trying to pull it out of my body. That is a very uh, common side effect after hysterectomy. It's a pulling sensation, especially when you go from standing to sitting or if you sit down in a car hard. Um, so, you know, you're only six months out, honey. You're still deep in your recovery from hysterectomy. Hysterectomy takes about a year to recover from. So it really could be related to your post-op recovery from your hysterectomy. Heather said, I'm going to see a doctor tomorrow to discuss my symptoms. I feel the need to pee all the time, irritation, frequency. Is there anything I should be sure to do to make the most of my appointment? I don't have an IC diagnosis yet. Yeah, you know, hun, listen, when you go to the doctor, I don't want you to say IC. Do not say IC. Do not let those letters leave your mouth. I want you to walk in and discuss your symptoms. Doctor, I cannot sleep through the night. I'm getting up three, four, five times a night doctor, I have this weird sensation uh, when I sit down or, you know, I have pain that shoots down my leg or I have this feeling of pressure or if you're leaking, I, I'm leaking, something like that. Your job at that appointment is to get your doctor to study your pelvic cavity, right? Um, and not only should they be looking at your bladder, but Ideally, we would really also want them to do a very quick pelvic floor assessment just to touch your muscles to see if your muscles are part of the problem. Um, and the devil is in the details here. You got to really think about your symptoms and think about that really weird symptom that only happens once a week or once every two weeks. This weird shooting pain by your rectum or this weird painful arousal sensation or, you know, uh, a vibration. I had a gentleman call me. Uh, I don't know, maybe about eight or nine years ago. And he said, Jill, whenever I sit down, my penis starts to vibrate. And he said, it vibrates so violently that it almost throws me off of my chair. He goes, what is that? It's making me crazy. And thankfully, I'd already worked with somebody, my first person who'd ever had that. And that was, in fact, a pudendal nerve entrapment. That if your symptoms are positional, you're fine when you stand. But when you sit down, it hurts. But you get better when you stand up. We're talking muscles and nerves, my friends. We're talking muscles and nerves. Or if you have PGAD, where you have a painful arousal sensation or pins and needles or little areas of numbness, we're really going to be looking at muscles and nerves in that, in that circumstance. Uh, Lauren says, can I taper off Elmeron doing one pill a day and take the bladder builder, bladder ease and aloe? I'm dreading going up the Elmeron. I've been battling it in my head. So in 2006, Dr. Lowell Parsons 
who the inventor of Elmeron and Dr. Thea Harides, the inventor of Sister Protec, appeared at the San Diego IC conference. And somebody asked them that question. One of the first questions was, do I have to take Elmeron the rest of my life? And he said, no, no, you just have to figure out if it's going to help you or if it is helping you. How do you do that? You gradually reduce the day. If you're taking three a day, say go to two a day for a week. See how you do. If you don't get worse, go to one a day for a week. See how you do. And then this exact question is, how can I titrate off of Elmeron and move on to a supplement? And, and what they said was a one-to-one -one swap. So if you were taking three Elmeron a day, what they said is go down to two Elmeron and do one of your supplement. Do that for a week. Let's see how your symptoms do. If you do okay, then you can go to one Elmeron and two of the supplement and see how you do for a week. And then you can do, you could, you could then stop the Elmeron and go right on the supplement, right? So that's straight from the horse's mouth guy. That's straight from the two of the top doctors in the ICU world. I, I am not supposed to give you medical advice. This is entering an area that's a, that's a little bit dicey. Um, I would, what I would tell you is definitely talk to your doctor about it and ask your doctor if your doctor would agree with that protocol before you do it. Uh, Sandra says, my grandfather died of bladder cancer, so I wonder if he had IC as well. He did not even say anything until a week before he died. He kept it. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. You know, bladder, the number one cause of bladder cancer is smoking, cigarette smoking. Um, and it, it's very subtle at first. The, the sad thing about bladder cancer is that it's literally considered the easiest cancer you could ever have. Very, very easy to treat if, they, if you've caught it, caught it early. But once it, it enters the muscle of the bladder, it becomes a bit more tricky and it can pass through the bladder and or it can spread. Hey, you know, Bill Clinton, y'all heard President Bill Clinton was at UC Irvine because he had a bladder infection that became septic. He became septic and he's been on IV antibiotics. He was on IV antibiotics for a couple of days. They released him, I think, this morning. Bless him. I hope he, I hope he continues to recover. We all know what it's like to have terrible bladder pain. Can you imagine having terrible bladder pain, but then you're se you're septic? Uh, Mandy said, "Should I ask that they look in the bladder? PTNS isn't helping. They already did a bladder a, a bladder. Did they do a bladder installation or a bladder distension, Ma uh, Mandy? If they did installations and your bladder's not responding to therapy." and your symptoms are strongly suggestive of your bladder wall and or if they think that you have a Hunter's lesion, then yeah, the hybrid distension with cystoscopy or a cystoscopy done with narrow band imaging would be uh, the, the right thing to do to at least allow them to look in your bladder to see if there's anything weird going on there, like a bladder stone, something else going on. You know, there's just a lot of, let's just say that the American Urology Association, when they issued their IC guidelines, they, they came off of the hydro distension bandwagon. They acknowledge how many, that so many patients were hurt through hydro distensions and, and especially what we call high pressure, long duration distensions. And they specifically say those should not be done anymore. Yes, there are moments when we have to look in the bladder. They have to rule out cancer in some of you, especially if you have a, a urine cytology test or if you do have any other wound in your bladder. It's important to let them look at that. But if in contrast, you have a completely normal looking bladder on cysto, that's actually good news. And if you come out of a hybrid distension with completely normal looking bladder, that's really good news. That's your clue that you have to look beyond the bladder to see if they can figure out what's causing your symptoms. Could you have a fibroid tumor pushing on your bladder? Could you have a Tarlov cyst coming off of your spine? There are many other conditions that can be triggering the symptoms that we associate with the bladder. Mary says, if there's no inflammation, then why would ibuprofen work? Does that mean there's no inflammation or no? You know, I don't, I don't know, honey. I don't know. I really don't know. I'm, I'm, I can't, 
off the top of my head tell you the mechanism of action for ibuprofen right now. We could look it up, but we have a lot of questions to go through. Christine said, I had COVID in April. I had no IC symptoms during that time. Awesome. You know, we did a survey. Uh, we, we still have our COVID and IC survey together. 75% of IC patients who got COVID report that they flared. And some of them very, very severely. But 25% of them who got COVID had no problems at all. No problems at all. And so I'm glad you're in, you're in that group. Lisa says, can you speak on reactive arthritis? Uh, honey, I can't. I'd have to prepare. I don't have any knowledge level on that. Vicki says, get inflammation, reinducing foods out of the diet. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you. That should have come off of cough, come out of my head right away. That means dairy, trans fat, sugar, white flour, replace it with anti-inflammatory foods, greens, beans, berries, veggies, whole grains. It's helpful. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you, Vicki. I, I double dog anybody to try to come and talk about IC for three hours uh, in one sitting. I mean, it just there are moments when the brain just doesn't deliver the information. <laughs> Susan said, I've called my DO. The plan is pain medication and go to the ER if you can't pass your, and then they will remove the clots through a three-way catheter. It's beyond painful. Holy hell, Susan. I'm so sorry that you're going through, going through that. That's awful. Don't wait. The minute you can't empty your bladder, you need to get to the emergency room because that is an emergency. Laura says, I'm on an estriol suppository. I tried to get some estrogen cream from my primary care provider last week, and she said no. Why? Well, maybe she was worried that you're getting too much, you know, uh, so you might have to pick and choose. Do you want the estriol suppository or the estrogen cream? Mary says uh, estrogen cream made you burn and even the additives. Oh, your doctor can't figure it out. I thought it was additives, but nope, compounds burn too. Um, Mary, it would be very interesting for you to look around for, you know, compounding pharmacies. The, I like the Women's International Pharmacy because they specialize in working, creating formulations for people who are super sensitive like me. Um, they may have something else that you might be able to try. I mean, um, olive oil, coconut oil, uh, so they, you know, they're the ones with the expertise on trying to figure out what's triggering some of your irritation. Carla says, if you use estrogen cream, do you have to balance it using progesterone cream? If you're still have, if you still, so, so here's the deal, you know, you have to understand that, um, uh, even though you're older and you're not having periods, your body and your uterine lining has the potential to still thicken. It's called um, a, a endometrial hyperplasia. So what the estrogen is doing is the estrogen that you're getting is, is triggering the growth of endometrial tissue. Um, but because you're past the change, you're not having a period. And so that tissue can get thicker and thicker and thicker. Uh, the challenge is, with endometrial tissue is that there are normal cells and abnormal cells that they call complex cells. So if you're, so hold on a sec, your normal the, the normal thickness of your uh, endometrium is four. I believe it's four millimeters. When I had mine, it was six. And the doctor was like, well, you're on oral estrogen. That sounds pretty normal. Let's just see if we can force a period. So they put me on pro oral progesterone for three months. And at the end of that three months, um, we came back and we measured it again. 
and it had not gotten smaller. It had gotten bigger. It was now an eight. And that's when he went, uh oh, that's not good. I got to look in your uterus. And they did a, um, um, they looked in my uterus and then they did a DNC. And that was the complex endometrial hyperplasia that was precancer. So to answer your question, do you have to use progesterone cream to balance it? I don't think so, but you need to ask your pharmacist about it or ask your doctor about it. Michelle says, what supplements can help the mucosal lining in the bladder? I have, sh I have Sjogren's syndrome. Any supplement that contains chondroitin. We had a research study a year and a half, almost two years ago, that showed that chondroitin was the ingredient that was the most successful at restoring the superficial integrity of the bladder wall. That was pre presented at the uh, European Society for the Study of IC annual meeting, I think, two years ago. And so the supplements that have chondroitin are going, I just happen to have them here because I was looking at the ingredients for somebody yesterday or Friday. Uh, going to be bladder builder. Bladder builder is the, uh, is the most aggressive formula that we have because it's got chondroitin. It's got high, it's got um, quercetin for the antihistaminic effect. It's got some beneficial probiotics for the gut uh, and the biome. It's got some essential amino acids, but what makes bladder builder completely different from all of the other ones is that it has PEA in it, palmitoethanolamide for pain relief. So PEA has been used in Europe for about 20 years for a variety of pain conditions. Many, many research studies on it, very, very successful. They brought their first ICPEA study to the United States two years ago at the American Urology Association meeting. That study found that three months of use, at three months of use of PEA, 87% of patients reported a significant reduction in their pain. And by month six, some of, some of these patients were now pain-free and the rest were doing remarkably better. So we did a one-year follow-up study with Bladder Builder a year ago, um, and 60% of the patients who tried Bladder Builder loved it. Some of them were now pain-free. I think 20 to 25% were completely pain-free using Bladder Builder. The rest were reporting shorter flares, fewer flares, and less painful flares. The 40% who chose not to use it, they had three topical reasons. Number one, they couldn't afford it because it's over $50 a month. Number two, their doctor wanted them to do something else. Or number three, they had a gut-related side effect, which any of the supplements can call. Any of the supplements on the market have the potential to cause a stomach upset. Nicole here on, on YouTube says, I love Bladder Builder. That's great. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. So Bladder Builder is right now the most complex and the most, I think the, the, the most bold, for lack of a better term, supplement on the market. And quite a few patients are using it with great success. However, if you flare when you eat yogurt, if you flare when you take a probiotic, you would not be doing Bladder Builder because it has probiotics in it. What you would be doing instead, if you find that you are super, 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 super sensitive and you hate taking anything because you never know how you're going to react. Hello, I see subtype five central sensitization. My primary subtype bladder rest would be the choice. Bladder rest was created specifically for people who are remarkably sensitive. So there are very few ingredients in this, and it's also in an avocado oil base. Um, so it has chondroitin, arginine, quercetin, citrulline, rutin, and sodium, uh, rutin and sodium hyaluronate. And so for the patients who are super, super sensitive, this is what we suggest. And obviously you never, ever, ever take a full dose of anything at the, on the first day. You got to take one, just one capsule and see how you do. See if your body likes it. If your body likes it, do one a day for a week. See how you do. See how you do. If you do okay with one a day, you can go to two a day. See how you do. You can go to three a day. You can go to four a day. Now, I will tell you, when I was using Sister Protec uh, about mm, seven, eight years ago, um, I never got past one. When I went to two, it gave me loose bowel. But one a day was fine for me with Sister Protoc. The bladder builder obviously wasn't around then. So it's about finding the dosage that works the best for you. More is not necessarily better. You know, there's an important pharmacology, pharmacology concept that I really like, and it's called the lowest effective dose. What's the least amount of medication you can still take and get a good 
beneficial reaction from it. And for those of us who are super, 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 super sensitive, you know, we don't like taking new things. They're scary because we never know how we're going to react. So I'm not a more person. I'm a less person, but that's me personally. Of course, we do also still have Sister Protect. It's a different label. Um, uh, so Sister Protect certainly is still available. This has been around for over 20 years and developed by Dr. Thea Harides at Tufts University, federally funded IC researcher. Um, a new label. Um, and then we have Sister Renew. And Sister Renew, I mean, there's a whole history evolution with these sister with these supplements. Sister Renew, same ingredients, chondroitin, quercetin, but they added a little tiny bit of aloe to it and a little bit of lemon balm to calm nerves down. This has uh, fallen out of favor pretty much. I mean, most of those people who are trying to calm nerves down are usually just going with bladder builder instead. But there is diversity. At least we have a tremendous amount of diversity now, things that you can try. Right. And now that Elmeron is kind of off the table because of the retinal disease, at least you've got some things to try. But remember, and this is a this is a point that I, I hit every single time in every conversation I have with people. We have to understand the concept of cause versus effect. The symptom you're having is the effect. We have to understand the underlying problem, because for some of you, supplements would be pointless. Absolutely pointless. If you've got tight pelvic floor muscles, if you got vaginismus, um, if you were hurt, you sustained some sort of traumatic injury, you got a bad hip, whatever, the bladder wall supplement is a complete waste of time and money. You got to invest your money in doing what will treat that, which is going to be pelvic floor physical therapy, right? And also, um, think about central sensitization. For those of us who have chronic overlapping pain conditions, again, my subtype. Uh, so we've got IC, avulvodynia, uh, TMJ, uh, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, that cluster of chronic pain conditions. That's a central nervous system disorder. You know, so now we, we know what that is all about. And we know that that's a brain that's stuck in fight or flight. And so therapeutically, we got to get that brain out of fight or flight. We know how to do that. And again, so a bladder wall supplement, not particularly meaningful. What would be meaningful for people who have nerve sensitivity is going to be Piora. P-E-A-O-R-A. -E this is the palmito ethanolamide. So this is what I take. But people always ask, what do you take? Well, this is my subtype. I've got wickedly sensitive nerves. So I'm going to do something that is going to calm nerves down. And that's Piora for me. Lavelle said, I found all estrogen creams are not made the same. So true. I've used bioidenticals made from yams only. There have been times when I believe another kind was used causing my icy bladder. No, changing cream. With it from a different pharmacy, solve that problem. You know, I just got something right there. What is that? Weird. Lisa says, wonder if, if the one that used estrogen cream has lichen sclerosis. Yeah, like if you if you got lichen sclerosis, lichen sclerosis is literally a massive inflammatory reaction in uh, the vulva. And your skin turns white. Sierra says, "I'm supposed to be on Elmeron, but I don't take it because of the side effects." I mean, so you really, Sierra, you got to talk to your doctor about your concern for the side effects. Even you, even if your doctor minimizes it, you know, it's your body. You're the one who ultimately decides what you're going to do or not do. Um, so we do have, you know, there are other things that you can try. Anne says, any idea benzos can negatively affect the bladder wall lining? Um, not off the top of my head. I don't think so. Mandy said, my estrogen is so high that I have not had a period since February. We keep doing the progesterone withdrawal test every other month with no luck. 
I'm having a really hard time finding a pelvic floor therapist as a Eurogyne uh, suggested. Mandy, if you tell me what state you're in, I can look them up for you. Uh, we also have a database right on our website, but I also have a separate data database that Harvard Medical School gave me that I can look up. Sandra says, I have nerve damage at the bottom of my bladder, so I was told the nerve pain radiated into my vagina. Hormone therapy did not work. It aggravated me, and I tried for months. I did MLT five sessions, and it has greatly reduced my flares. Honey, what does MLT stand for? I'm not sure. MLT. What does that mean? MLT. Is that the laser therapy? Anne says, what about coconut oil to repair atrophy? Coconut oil will cover up the skin, but it's not going to repair anything. Sue sends 380 stars, a three-week donor. Thank you so much, Sue. Estrogen cream twice a week isn't enough. That's Rebecca, because I still have a period about three times a year, so they prescribed basic birth control for your bladder pain. Can that work for dryness? Uh, well, my dear, I you're, you're not going to know, I guess, until you try it. We did have a case study that was released a year ago of an 18-year-old girl who started birth control pill and two weeks later developed all the symptoms associated with IC. And unfortunately, over a period of a year, as her symptoms got worse and worse and worse, she had many, many diagnoses. She was told she had chronic yeast, told that she had IC, overactive bladder, and she just, her condition just continued to worsen. And finally, like the fifth doctor she saw said, so did you start birth control? She said, yes. And he, they went, oh, you need to stop it. And she stopped the birth control and it took about two months, but she was healed. So I don't know. I don't know, hon. That's a little complex. Lisa says, I was on Elmer for 20 years. I went off of it in February of this year. I was good for about six months, but the last two months have been bad. Started taking amitriptyline a couple of weeks ago. It has helped some, but not like when I was on Elmer. So Lisa, are you doing any chondroitin supplement? Have you tried any of those? I mean, patients have been getting off of Elmeron for a decade now because it's been so expensive. So many have successfully converted to the supplements and they're doing quite well. Um, Jeannie says, I just started using Valium suppositories. Do you know if I can use the estrogen cream at the same time? You have to talk to your pharmacist about that. I can't imagine why you wouldn't be able to, but, um, you know, maybe using them a couple of hours apart after they dissolve, maybe talk to your pharmacist, see what they say. Michelle says, how do you get estrogen cream from your pharmacy? Your doctor has to put a prescription in. Sandra, whose grandfather died of bladder cancer, never smoked. I, Sandra, I mean, I bet you though, he was exposed to somebody who was smoking because we have research that has conclusively proven that children exposed to secondhand smoke can develop all the bladder symptoms associated with IC from the chemical irritants of the smoke in, accumulating in their urine. So even though he didn't smoke, I bet you he was exposed to somebody who was smoking. I bet he was. I bet he was. Mary says, my doctor is going to do a, cysto, a cystoscopy in November, says they will see Hunter's lesions. I'm confused why they keep saying that you need why they keep saying you need a hydro to see it. She says they aren't doing the hydro anymore. Mary, it depends upon their equipment. There's a specific type of cystoscope called a narrow band imaging cystoscope that will see a hunter's lesion that can be done in the doctor's office. And I actually now think I, I, I saw a study last week that referred to another type of cystoscope that would see hunter's lesions. So, you know, it depends on their equipment. The challenge with the narrowband imaging, which we've known about for about five years, is that the equipment was really expensive and urology clinics usually don't weren't willing to invest in that. Cindy said, I saw brown spots on my bladder. My doctor said I had a lot of inflammation was seen. Cytology came back negative. Okay, that's good news. That's good news. So now I got to figure out what the hell's irritating your bladder every day. 
You know, guys, like ser seriously, your bladder can be irritated if you're drinking coffee or soda every day. I was I was working with somebody like early last week. God, what was that? I don't remember what that was. Oh, no, no, no. I think I told this story last week. It was um, a woman who called 71 years old, uh, severe IC, really suffering with pain. And she was doing 2000 milligrams of vitamin C a day. And then she was taking a lot of other supplements that had vitamin C. And I ranted because somebody told her that it was a magnesium issue. It's not. No, come on. She's 71 years old. She's got estrogen atrophy and she's taking massive amounts of acid. And I asked her, I said, you know, who told you to take vitamin C? Vitamin C is as a well-known trigger for bladder irritation, especially in an older woman. And it was somebody in an online support group 10 years ago. It's like, well, screw them. She suffered needlessly for 10 years because she was taking massive amounts of vitamin C. So you can damn well bet that her bladder was bright red. I mean, she, she was taking a lot of supplements that were completely inappropriate that would have been extremely irritating to her bladder. But we know that that irritation can ease and the bladder can heal if you remove the irritant. But if you're bathing your bladder in acid every day, especially if you're older, you can darn well bet your bladder is going to be red as hell. Brittany says, have you seen people who can't eat, who can eat who can't eat fruits ever get to a point where they can again, even with a limited capacity? If the bladder has an opportunity to heal, yes. If you have Hunter's lesions, that the lesion is healed, then potentially, you know, there are good fruits and bad fruits. The the fruits that are generally lowest in acid that I see patients tolerate well are going to be pears, uh, mild sweet apples like a Fuji apple or a Gale apple, blueberries. Uh, you could try honeydew melon, um, and, and just know that this, the riper the fruit, the lower the acid as fruit ripens, acid levels drop. Think about it. If you eat an unripened apple, it's bitter as hell. There's a lot of acid in there. And that final maturation process as the, as the fruit ripens and the sugars develop, the acid levels drop. Um, and so you want to make sure that you're eating fruit that's ideally from a, a farmer's market grown on the vine where it's right, where it's, it's not sitting in storage for three months in a supermarket chain, you know? Here, hold on a sec. Nicole said, how much PR do you take? I just, the recommended two a day. Hello, Alan. Um, you met my doc. We talked at length, though. He, he was suggesting nocturia, nocturnal poly something. Hmm. Heather asked, I don't know what the, uh, I don't know what you mean, Alan. I don't, I don't know what that is. Heather says, has research ever provided more insight into why people flare from hormones? Is it, a, is it the mucus change? Yeah, the mucus does change as our hormones fluctuate every 30 days. That's pretty well known. It's not being studied well. It should be. I do believe that hormones play a much bigger role uh, than we realize. For those of you, uh, for women watching who are strong, getting, your, getting older, there is a, a couple of fabulous doctors on Twitter, uh, Dr. Rachel Rubin. Rachel Rubin, I really recommend that you follow her. She is like the preeminent expert in um, how your body changes over time. Also, Dr. Jennifer Gunter, the author of The Menopause Manifesto. They're both fabulous on Twitter. Do, doc, do docs do biopsies for IC, Heather? Only if the diagnosis is in doubt and or you have a, uh, you have a uh, positive urine cytology that suggested that there might be cancer. Sierra says, do apples have acid in it? There are some types of apples that are pretty high in acidic acid, like Granny Smith. One of the reasons why Granny Smith apples make a good apple pie is because you got the tartness from the acid. I would never use Granny Smith. So I make a lot of apple stuff. Uh, I always use Fuji or Gala apples. Uh, nocturnal polyuria. Hmm. Do you have any, uh, uh, any idea why? 
Heather said, so we need to win the lottery to get more research going. Hey, you know what? Listen, remember when the lottery was, what, 600 million? Uh, I came online I told, and I said, I'll tell you exactly what I'd do if I win the lottery. I'd start two foundations. I'd start a family foundation that would help my family as we got older to make sure that everybody had care as they got older. And the other one would be a research foundation and a scholarship uh, that would also handle scholarships for patients and patients in need. Because, yeah, we do need more research right now. There's not, yeah, understand that, that pharmaceutical companies who fund the bulk of research out there are only going to do it if they see a profit potential somehow. They see something that they can sell. And we just don't have any pharmaceutical companies right now that are interested in, in this group of patients. And of course, now we know why so many, all those millions of dollars were wasted because they put apples, oranges, and bananas in the same research study. You cannot put Hunter's lesion patients, estrogen atrophy patients, pelvic floor patients, and pudendal neuralgia patients, and central sensitization patients in the same research study and expect that to work for everybody. It doesn't work that way. And they finally admitted it in, I think, in an article, Phil Hanno, uh, who is the um, uh, chairman of the IC Committee for the American Urology Association, is at Stanford. You know, everybody listens to what he says. And, and I'm pretty sure he was the one who wrote the article that said, listen, we can't do that anymore. We have got to put the right patients in the right study. And, and he's focusing on two fundamental groups, and that is bladder centric and beyond bladder. And of course, I use the Chris Payne system, which is much more detailed than that. But at least we have really good acknowledgement that yes, some of you have a bladder wall issue, but a lot of you have something going on beyond your bladder. And we cannot expect you to respond to a bladder therapy. And we know for sure that many of you don't, because when you look at the research for Elmeron, you know, basically Elmeron performs about placebo, you know, 30%, maybe one study, I think found 50% of patients responded to Elmeron as a bladder therapy, but that means 50% of you didn't respond. Why? Because it probably is not your bladder, that your bladder is a victim of something else going on. Oh, okay. So Alan, he just said, he suggested it as a cause of frequent ur urination. I read a paper this summer that talked about, no, it was, okay, hold on. It was for my dad. And it was like, he was asking, why do I have to pee so much at night? And it was something about um, that it's easier for the heart, that people in, now, and, and I'm, I'm going to get, don't, do not quote me. And I'm probably getting this wrong. Um, but I think that they, that, hold on a sec. Let me just, I don't even want to say it. Let me look it up. Okay. So I actually was going to be, ex hmm. So patients in heart failure have a decreased blood flow to the kidneys, which causes you to retain fluid. But at night, that fluid sloughs off as frequent urination. But see, my dad doesn't have heart failure. You know, he's, he's a beast. I mean, he's a, he's a beast. It's crazy. So... A weak heart can't pump blood efficiently, causing fluids to build up in the body. The kidneys work to reduce, to rid the body of the excess fluid, causing large amounts of urine production and frequent urination. So that is one potential scenario, but I'm sure there are many, many more. So, so do not freak out just because I, I mentioned that. I'm glad you're getting a second opinion. You should. Heather says you have great. Oh, yeah, we do. In our family, everybody lives. And this is the. This is the life of a Norwegian and Swedish, man. We're a hearty beast here. So in our family on both sides, late 90s, 
dad's the last living right he's lived he's lived the longest of all of them i think he could live he could live till he's 105 at this point in time it's gonna be a hell of a lot of work oh god oh i i i can only tell you that i love my parents dearly obviously i'm here and caring for them but it is difficult it is difficult I'm good. Need help. If he lives till he's 105, I'm going to need help. I cannot do it all. But the challenge here is how do we pay for it? See, like his generation, they have pensions. My generation doesn't have pensions. And, and the IC network is free. <laughs> so it's not like I have a good retirement fund here. So I appreciate your donations very, very much. And let's just say I, every time I go to the store, I buy $10 worth of lottery tickets. And I'm investing what little savings I have gets invested. I attended a, 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 a lecture on mini cap stocks, stocks that cost less than a dollar and um, micro stocks, right? So the, the, so the goal here is, is to buy something, let's just say it costs 10 cents a share, right? So you so you can like buy a thousand shares for what, 10 bucks, right? Something like that. And then you just pray that, hey, maybe they're going to make it, you know, make big. And one day those shares are going to be worth $800. <laughs> anyway, in this lecture that I attended yesterday. They say you have to have at least 45 different stocks <laughs> because <laughs> most of them fail. Like 1% might succeed. <laughs> I haven't bought any and I don't know anything about that. But anyway, I'm getting older. I really have to think about stuff like this now. Hysteroscopy. Thank you, Michelle. Mandy, thank you for the 99 stars. I wrote, Michelle, thank you for your 50 stars. I really appreciate it. Christy says, what's the best treatment for pressure? You've been dealing with this for over a year. Well, you know, pressure is often a pelvic floor symptom. Um, it, pressure is, a, is like, I don't think I've ever had pressure in my bladder. Uh, I've had pressure in my bowel. I've never had pressure in my bladder. And so I kind of think of pressure as one way that your brain interprets pain. And sometimes, um, but it, it really, the far more important question is, is do you have pain as your bladder fills with urine and do you feel better when you pee or do you have pain after you're done peeing? If you have pain before urination, we're really looking at your bladder wall. If you have pain after urination, we're really looking at your pelvic floor. Carla says here, pelvic floor therapy has helped me a lot. Mary says, any news on getting these supplements to Canada without super high shipping fees? Nope. I wish what Canadian patients do. And this, hey, you know what? This would be an opportunity for a Canadian up there is if you're close to the border, come over the border and get, get a PO box in the U S and if there's a, if there's a, I've got a couple of Canadian customers where they, they bound together and together they rented a box, even though they're like 200 miles away from the border. And once a week, somebody goes down or once every two weeks and empties the box and gets their shipments. But shipping, shipping and customs is out of control right now. Deborah says, I just got a bottle of bladder rest. Is this for every day or for flares? It's for every day. We don't have a supplement for flares. Um, and like I said earlier, we're thinking about a tea for flares. I, and Natural Approach Nutrition is working on something for flares. Um, but we just don't have that yet. Marlia says, I was taking a muscle relaxant called Tizanidine, very helpful, but then I looked at the side effects and read that it can cause UTIs, told my doctor, she Googled it and said, wow. <laughs> so what muscle relaxant could be safe so that won't cause a UTI? Marlia, there are two different types of muscles. We have to know which muscle we're trying to address. Uh, you could have, if, uh, if you're having bladder spasms, that's smooth muscle. 
And so the antispasmodics for that are going to be Detrol or Ditropan or Mirabigron. If you're having pelvic floor spasms, that is striated muscle, that's skeletal muscle. You have to use a skeletal muscle relaxant, that's Flexeril, Baclofen, Valium. Hello, Caroline from Dagenham, England. I hope you are well. Darla says, any supplement for Hunter's lesions? No. I don't know of any supplement that targets Hunter's lesions right now. I mean, maybe, I mean, the Peora might help calm some of the nerve pain down. Maybe a little bit of aloe might be a little bit soothing, but I don't know, uh, you know, that's tricky. If, if, if it's a viral infection, let's say you have next generation testing and they do find a virus in your urine, then it would be lysine. Lysine is known for interfering in the replication, interfering in viral replication. Oh, Sandra says, MLT Mona Lisa Taj. Cool. Thank you for reminding me. I appreciate that. Uh, Lisa says, my friend just keeps getting exams, but I know she thought she was cured after being on Elmeron for about five years. And bam, she was told she needs to stay on it for relief that it doesn't cure you. No, Elmeron is not a cure. Elmeron is the equivalent of a Band-Aid. It's a chemical coating. It coats your bladder. It doesn't cure things. We have to, you know, and again, that's why subtyping is so useful. So we can try to figure out what the ultimate cause is. If she's got estrogen atrophy, the reason why her bladder wall is vulnerable is because of her age and the loss of estrogen. Then really what they would be doing, the the it's not a cure, but what would help the most would be estrogen because your estrogen will improve the health of that skin and help that skin produce mucus. David says, what if someone smokes but not around children? Is that still a danger? Absolutely. Absolutely. Come on. I mean, how many times have you had somebody walk up to you and they're a smoker? And even if they don't have a cigarette, you are enveloped enveloped in the smell of smoke. You know, somebody who's smoking, they, they lose a sense of smell. They have no idea that they reek, you know, and kissing a smoker is like kissing an ashtray. That's what we used to say in college. Um, and so those chemicals, you know, they end up, if you buy a home of somebody who's a smoker, man, it's embedded in the walls. Like literally you're going to have to pull the, if you're super sensitive, sensitive, like I am, you're going to have to re-drywall the house to get rid of the smell of the smoke. Bethany says, can you take chondroitin without glucosamine? Uh, yeah, in fact, um, it's the glucosamine is not believed to have any beneficial effect for the bladder. It's really all about the chondroitin. Linda says, can you repeat the estrogen cream? I use a um, propylicon, is it propylene glycol? No, paraben, paraben-free estradiol cream paraben free estradiol cream. Carla says, does pre-leaf work? Absolutely pre-leaf works. Pre-leaf can help to reduce the acid level in your urine. If you're going to go somewhere, go out to eat, and you're worried about food irritating your bladder, you can absolutely take a one or two pre-leaf ahead of that meal to try to neutralize some of that acid. Preleaf is the oldest, most highly recognized supplement. It is now recognized as a medical food, medical food specifically recommended for patients with interstitial cystitis who are struggling with a food-induced flare. Preleaf is viable. It is an option. You just don't take it like candy. You don't eat it all day. You only eat it when you're going to eat something that might be irritating. You know, the aloe that, that we are using now is called Allopath. It's the same anthracrinone free uh, al organic aloe, but we added a little bit of PEA in it to give you that pain reducing effect of the PEA also. Uh, Michelle asking, can you order compounded? No, you need a prescription from your doctor. Anne says, should I get a CAT scan on my bladder to rule out tumors? 
Well, no, because if you have bladder, if you're worried about bladder cancer, what you would do is you would ask for a, um, a urine cytology test. Remember, the bladder wall is pretty thin. You know, it's pretty thin. And so if you have cancer, it's not like it's going to go a big giant tumor in, in the bladder wall. The, the tumor is going to come out into the bladder or out beyond the bladder fairly quickly. And so that's why they do a urine cytology test, because that will find cancer markers in your urine. But that, again, that's a really good question for your doctor. Melissa says, I'm having a hard time wrapping my brain around this. My symptoms didn't get worse until I fully stopped soda. Now, if I have any drink other than water, I flare and have all sorts of bathroom issues. You had a vanilla ice cream homemade and I'm having overactive symptoms. Lately, I have been drinking pH 7.5 pH water, which helps significantly. I can't drink alkaline water, though, because it causes pressure and or pain. You know, Melissa, I think I think I've worked with one other patient in the last 25 years who uh, when she stopped soda, she said water made her worse. And I really have to wonder about just the quality of the water. There are some waters out there, especially, you know, tap waters that, you know, are, are massively treated and there just might be something in the tap water that's irritating you. Thank you, Rhonda. Rhonda says, I can imagine how hard it is to take care of your parents. Oh, don't have much of a life right now. I like literally do the ICN and care for them. I have not had a night away in over three years. And it's wearing on me. I got to say, it's wearing on me. And because of COVID, I can't, I, I just can't let, I can't bring anybody in because my dad's an anti-vaxxer. Nothing I can say to convince him. So I can't let anybody into the house, you know, to spend the night here. I need a vacation. I need a vacation. I just want to go down the highway five miles to a little spa and spend the night. I just want to lay in front of a fireplace and just breathe. <sighs> Heather says, in your experience, do patients have success with naturopathic approaches? Not particularly. Not particularly. You know, you got, you got to have the right diagnosis here. I mean, that's a problem. Remember, cause versus effect. Natural, until we do a deep dive into the potential cause, you know, you're guessing. You're just guessing. So at a minimum, pelvic floor examination, let's make sure the pelvic floor muscles aren't involved so that we can do physical therapy because naturopathy is not going to help tight pelvic floor muscles. It's physical therapy that works. Haley says, have you heard of any link between IUDs and IC and pelvic pain? Yes, that, that has been discussed fairly frequently in the last 10 years or so. No, the last 20 years or so. There certainly have been a number of patients who reported it. I've taken that question many, many times over the years, Haley. Sorry. Rhonda says, it's a shame your brother cannot stay for one night. Yeah. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice, huh? Wouldn't that be nice? He could. He doesn't want to. Mary says, ask Jill about Elmeron, please. It has bad side effects. So again, Elmeron is the only oral medication approved for IC. Okay. Um... It has a number of side effects. Um, it can change liver enzyme levels. Yeah, they have to monitor your liver. It can cause your hair, uh, your hair to fall out. It can cause a variety of gut issues. Even a year or two into it, all of a sudden you end up with diarrhea from it. Um, but our biggest concern about, and it can cause easy, easy bleeding, bruising. If you are ever scheduled to have any sort of major procedure, 
uh, surgery, they usually need you off the Elmeron for a couple of months so that we're not dealing with that, the um, easy bleeding. But of course, now we know that Elmeron is linked to retinal disease and for some patients has caused blindness. And so Elmeron has fallen off out of favor because of that. Uh, it's pretty serious. And in our study, um, well, in the medical studies as a whole, uh, I, I, the, I know a, a eye doctor at Kaiser Permanente in his first study, uh, patients uh, using currently using Elmeron, I think 20 to 25 percent showed active retinal disease. Um, and so that's been fairly consistent across the different research studies around that have been talking about this for the last couple of years. Our study, which is an informal study, certainly not a, uh, a peer-reviewed study that's going to be published in a peer-reviewed magazine. It was just designed to credibility test this theory of could Elmeron patients potentially have an eye disease. I have 2,000 patients in that study and 54%, 54% of those patients report retinal disease. But of course, that study does not exclude hereditary retinal disease. But it certainly established such a clear link that Dr. Hanno said, outstanding work, Jill, please send this to the FDA. And that was part of the work that was sent to the FDA that led to the FDA uh, putting the new warning label on uh, uh, Elmeron last year. That was from IC Network Research. Part of it was from IC Network Research. Sierra says, Elmeron made my hair fall out and, and gave you stomach problems. That was very common, very common. Amanda says, I really need help with the constant burning in my urethra. So Amanda, burning in the urethra, especially you don't, I can't really tell how old you are. Understand that you, the urethra is the canary in the coal mine when it comes to estrogen atrophy. So it's a urethra that's the first part of the urinary tract that often starts screaming when your skin starts to get dry. Uh, I have a really good article on our website, uh, icnetwork.org, the seven causes of urethral pain. I encourage you to go over to icnetwork.org, Google urethra. You can read that study. But really, the very, very first thing we're going to look at with urethral pain is the quality and health of your skin. Do you have estrogen atrophy? Uh, then there are other things too, chemical irritation, infection of the periurethral gland. There are other stuff. There, there are other things. So again, go on over to icnetwork.org and Google that. You can find that blog. Uh, Julie, thank you so much, Julie, for the 50 stars. I feel rich right now. I'm getting stars. Deborah says, how is bladder rest different from bladder builder? Can I take both? You don't need to take both. You would never take both. Uh, bladder builder is a much more aggressive formula. It has a lot more ingredients in it, including probiotics and PEA for pain relief. Bladder rest does not have those extra ingredients. It's a very simple formula for people who are really sensitive. Julie says, I was taken off Elmeron for 15 years. What do I do now? I'm having many flares due to overwhelming stress. I don't know how to take. So Julie, over on our website, we have an Elmeron transition guide. What you can do if you've been taken off Elmeron. And so Elmeron is a bladder coating. And so the first thing you could do is you could switch to bladder installations. They can give you rescue installations with heparin and lidocaine that will accomplish kind of the same thing. Um, and can potentially break you out of a really severe flare. Or you can come on over to the chondroitin-based supplements, which are also known to cause to uh, are believed to create that nice protective coating in the bladder wall from chondroitin. And so again, that's going to be uh, here. Hold on, it's going to be bladder builder, bladder rest, Cisto Protec. Cysto Mend, which I don't have a bottle of, and Cysto Renew. So there are five core supplements that patients generally transition to when they're getting off of Elmron. And the critical ingredient is chondroitin. If you come on over to the IC Network website, click on store. Well, actually, right on the front page of the website is an Elmron transition guide, right? I mean, I don't think I removed it yet. I'm going to be redesigning our, our front page really quickly. Uh, that's one of my goals this month. Hold on a sec. Do I still have it up there? Yep. 
You know where, if you go on our website to the treatment pull down menu, go to oral medication and you can go into the Elmeron eye disease. Oh crap, I took it off. Where did I put it? Oh, wait a second. Wait a second. That's because, you know what? You know where it is? It's over on our store website on the front page. It's an Elmeron transition guide. So go to icnsales.com and do that. And hold me one sec. Somebody's making some noise. Hold on. I got to stretch anyway. Well, I, I know. I'm just telling you. About, about 100 people listening right now. All right. Stretch break. Stretch break. Oh. Let's stretch out. Ah. Hello. Oh, hold on. Oh, man, sitting for a long period of time. Not easy. All right. Oh, it's right here, guys. You know, like where I get my cane is like right, just like right there. All right. So normally we do a Zoom meeting. I haven't done a Zoom meeting in a couple of weeks. I kind of feel like we should do a Zoom meeting. Um, so a Zoom is when you get to come in and share your story and I, I can talk to you directly. Uh, do you want to do a Zoom meeting? Let me know. If, if anybody wants to do the Zoom meeting, I can turn it on. Deb says, having surgery to remove a bladder stone from the bladder mesh that is eroded into my bladder. Holy hell, Deb, good luck. I think you'll feel much better when they get that bladder stone out. Anne says, should I get a CAT scan to rule out tumors? No. I mean, only if you're, I mean, well, no, hold on a sec. I don't like guessing, I like facts. And if you have doubts about your diagnosis, like I had doubts about my first diagnosis, I think that you can ask for, uh, you can ask for additional testing. I don't know if that would be a CAT scan. Uh, you could do an MRI. Um, you know, you're, you are an anatomical mystery to be solved. And if imaging, some sort of imaging would be, would help them study your study your pelvic cavity to see if there's anything else going on, like a diverticulum power to you, I say ask for it. Just don't assume it's a tumor. You know, for all we know, it could be scar tissue or again, a diverticulum or something like that. Susan said, I had respiratory problems with Elmeron and hair loss. It only took three to four weeks. Yeah. Carla says, praying for you. You're so helpful. Thank you. Thank you, honey. Kathleen said, I dodged a bullet refusing to take Elmeron because of the two side effects I, I was aware of. Yeah. And plus the cost was ridiculous. Exactly. Rhonda says, can we give any more information on the uh, bladder regeneration study, the bladderation? So we announced that last week. Dr. Evans asked me to ask you if there were any of you who had a small bladder capacity, 150 cc's or less, uh, who um, had symptoms of frequency urgency as well as potentially pain. Uh, they are now doing uh, bladder regeneration. So they are taking a one to two inch square piece of your bladder. They split it into different groups, the uh, different cell types. They grow it out. Your own tissue gets grown out in Petri dishes, for lack of a better term. They then mount them on a scaffold and create a structure very similar to what a normal bladder would look like. And then they're going to use that tissue to perform an augmentation to expand bladder capacity. This is very, very exciting because it's your own tissue. So rejection, tissue rejection should not happen. 
very absolute cutting edge research. And what's exciting about this is that this shows you the tremendous interests, the diverse interests that doctors have. So Dr. Robert Evans obviously is voted the top doctor in the country. Every single year we ever do votes for that. I turned those off for COVID because pat patients weren't seeing their doctors for the last two years. I'll be turning it back on probably next year. But Dr. Robert Evans has been voted number one every single time by hundreds of votes. I mean, patients love Dr. Evans. Uh, most of them do. Um, but he also happens to perform the surgery for these research studies. And that really speaks to his tremendous skill as a surgeon. And so it's very cool that he asked me to ask you for volunteers. So if anybody, again, you have a small bladder capacity, um, if you would be interested in that study, we got a blog on it over on our website. We got a post on our Facebook page. Uh, you have to email me, icnetwork at math.com, and I uh, will send you his contact information. I'm not going to put it out publicly in these meetings. He doesn't need 2,000 people to have his personal contact information. You're, it's just going to be you and who uh, the 20 or so people right now who have asked for more information. Judy says, we want to head south this winter, which means long hours on the road. How would you suggest... Uh, how would you suggest that you do it as you have a flare? Well, okay, so there's a bladder wall flare and a pelvic floor flare, Judy. So it's the pelvic floor that tends to get triggered with long car rides. Here you're, you're, you're driving along and bam, you know, you hit, you know, potholes and bumps. And it's this constant jiggling that tends to start tweaking your pelvic floor and potentially your bladder. So number one, car with a really smooth suspension, if at all possible. Doing a, doing a car with a rough suspension or a little mini car, or, uh, uh, like one of the European two-seater cars that just bounce like hell would be really rough on a long car ride. Uh, we do better with bigger cars, with, looser, with, uh, with uh, more um, uh, smooth suspensions. So that's going to be like Buick. Chevy Traverse, you know, things like that. Um, the um, Hyundai Palisade, the Kia Telluride, uh, the Nissan. I drive a Nissan Rogue and it's pretty good. It's just loud. It's just way, the road noise is way too loud and it's pretty small. I want to, I want to get rid of it, but we just can't get cars right now. It's too small to evacuate people. So big, a, a nice, bigger, smoother car. Like the perfect car, which you can't get right now, is a Crown Victoria. You can go, you, I see patients can go far in a Crown Victoria. The second thing you probably want to do is you want to stage it. You, you know, you really, I know that there's some people out there who, they, man, they want to drive 10 hours straight. And the problem is you sitting for 10 hours is going to tweak your pelvic floor. It's really important to stop every, every hour or every two hours at a rest stop or wherever and just get up and walk around for five minutes. Just shake it out. You got to shake it out. Uh, also, when you're traveling, please know that uh, Starbucks tends to have really, really good bathrooms. However, with COVID, a lot of places have shut down their bathrooms. They are not making their bathrooms available to people uh, like they used to. And so it might be very smart for you to carry a travel, John. And let me see. Here it is. So I, we, we have these in our store. I carry these in my car just for those moments when just in case you really, really need to be and there's no bathroom. Uh, it's a hysterical story. Oh, my God. Early, early on in our very, very first America Online IC group, Patty. It was Patty. And I think she's on Facebook. She did this hysterical story of stopping at the nasty, nasty, nasty uh, gas station and she's desperate to pee and the bathroom was filthy and she was like oh my god right so that's like when you drop trow and you squat over it and you try not to touch anything right she got stuck in the stall the door wouldn't open and she had to crawl out underneath the door in this filthy Filthy, filthy. Oh, it was the funniest story ever. 
we were dying laughing when she was telling us. So for moments like that, there is something called, oh crap, what's it called? Um, uh, I have one. Hold on. Let me get it. Okay, so it's amazing. I still have this. I've had this for 25 years. Okay, so they there is a device that a woman can use so that she can pee standing up. Literally just like a guy. And this is it. This is it. So it so you tuck this part over your urethra and there's a hole in the tip. And you can literally pee standing up. And I did it a couple of times. And guy, the shape is perfect. There was no leaking at all. It's just weird. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, most of us women, we're just master squatters. You, I can squat over anything and pee. Uh, but anyway, so um, you're just going to have to Google woman pee urinate standing up right? So it's like a, it's like a cough syrup thing, you know, cough syrup spoon, but you can see, see that? So you can see it fits perfectly right over the urethra. And yeah, there's a tip at the end. So you really can not pee standing up. Uh, is there a name on it? No, I don't remember what the name of this was, but I know that they're still on the market or or you can get a travel john. And I always have a couple of these in my car. I've never had to use one, but it takes the worry out. You know, Judy, because you got this profound worry that you're never going to have find a bathroom. Oh my God. I guess, I mean, I've even stopped and peed in snowbanks. And so this is called a travel john. This is what pilots use, you know, in small planes flying across the country or any or in fighter jets, where, I mean, well, they don't quite use this, but anyway, uh, this is ideal. Obviously, you just, you just put it between your legs like this, you pee right into it, and there are solids in this, the powder in this, that immediately solidifies your urine so that there's, so that it's not liquid anymore. So you just wrap it up, throw it in the trash, right? And so having, Having some of these in your car, Judy, would be really, really smart. I think it. I think they're like seven fifty for three. They're called Travel Johns, and of course, follow your diet. Maybe take a muscle relaxant if you've got pelvic floor tension. If you're not driving, maybe you can take a muscle relaxant. Maybe you can lay down in the back seat if you need to. Play with your sitting. You know, uh, just move around a lot. Okay. Judy says, what, what about vaginal muscle relaxers? Again, flexor. Well, you can do vaginal Valium suppository, or you can just take oral Valium, oral Flexoril, or oral Baclofen, okay? Megan says, I was just diagnosed, been watching, binge watching your channel. Thank you. Girl, listen, some of my videos on this channel are like 10 years old. I had far fewer wrinkles. <laughs> <laughs> but they're still pretty good. But I'm, I, I, you know, uh, there's a lot has changed and I need to do a lot more filming. And again, we were trying TikTok yesterday and uh, I, th I think we need to have a little TikTok videos too. Uh, Rhonda says, I feel like I'm getting my life back thanks to using catheter up to twice a day. And gabapentin, I'm getting a temporary inner stem on November 1st. I'm hoping it helps with retention so I don't have to cath anymore. Good luck to you, hon. Good luck. We have a really good we have a really good section uh, on inner stem over in the ICN support forum. Uh, we have four boards uh, considering neuromodulation, trying neuromodulation, success stories, and failures. So that's the IC network support forum over on our website. Uh, Lisa says, does allopath cause gastro issues? Any aloe can cause gastro issues. That's the nature of the beast. You say you had a reaction to desert harvest that I've worked with 
patients who've had reactions to Desert Harvest. And I would assume you would also have a reaction to the allopath as well as if you were to try it, the Sister Renew. There are some patients who are just aloe intolerant. And you're one of them, apparently. Anna, thank you for the 50 stars. Hello, Megan. Heather, why can you go into remission for years but then have flares again? The, Heather, great, great question. And I want you to think about, don't think about IC as a disease. Think about IC as injury, okay? So when we look at our broad subtypes, so Hunter's lesions, subtype one, bladder wall driven, which would include chemical cystitis, estrogen atrophy, maybe chronic infection, maybe some hormone variants in that group. Then we got pelvic floor. Then we got pudendal neuralgia. And then we got central sensitization, chronic overlapping pain conditions, right? So really the only major, major disease process that's happening in this patient community are Hunter's lesions. The rest of us have the equivalent of skin injury, skin irritation in their bladder, estrogen atrophy in their bladder, injury to their pelvic floor and or injury or sensitivity to nerves. So injuries happen. Injuries can happen to any of these. But here's the deal. The human body's wired to repair. And a lot of those injuries go away. They heal completely. And you can be fine for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And then bam, you get hurt again. You get a pelvic injury again. Or the, the far more common thing, Heather, really, quite to be quite honest, far more common thing is aging. That you had IC in your 30s. You had bladder symptoms in your 30s. They eventually calmed down. You were good through your 30s, good through your 40s. Bam, you're 55 years old and your symptoms have come back. But that might not actually be your original problem. That's probably the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. That's your skin reacting to the loss of estrogen, your bladder reacting to the loss of estrogen, now giving you frequency, urgency, pressure, pain. And so, so you know, a, a good scenario would be somebody in their 20s who, whose original symptoms were caused by tight muscles, like they had really, really tight muscles, their muscles healed, everything was good, they thought their IC was cured. Um, and then, you know, all of a sudden, 52, 53, 48, wherever, the estrogen levels drop, the bladder wall becomes much more sensitive, that one cup of coffee you were enjoying a day, all of a sudden it's hurting you because your bladder can't defend itself because it doesn't have that nice thick coating of mucus anymore because you're older. So that's the far more common thing we see. Although I will say with COVID, COVID has broken some patients who have been in re, quote unquote remission for 20 years, they get COVID and their bladder screams. And again, that's COVID cystitis is, is that cytokine storm. That doesn't mean it's the same as what they happened years ago. So cure is kind of the wrong word. Heal is the right word. Um, the, the only context where we, we really use the word cure is with patients with pelvic floor. Uh, we know that once we heal those pelvic floor muscles, that that patient is legitimately cured. And as well as I told a, I told a story uh, on our website, a blog earlier this summer about a patient who had severe Hunter's lesions and a severe prolapse. And when they went in to repair her prolapse and they were, so her uterus, so normally your uterus is anchored by two ligaments that keep it in place. One of them had broken and her uterus had rotated like this in her body. And when they repaired that and restored that second ligament, her Hunter's lesions healed completely and she was cured. So, and that raises a whole nother area of interest. And that is, you know, we associate Hunter's lesions really either with viral infection or with neuroinflammation. So the question is, is when this happens, where you lose one and this rotates, is that putting so much pressure on a nerve that's, that's causing a neuroinflammatory process that's triggering the lesion? Thus, when you get rid of that pressure and you restore the uterus and you're no longer pressing on that nerve, the lesion goes away. Sorry, that's kind of weird, but... Uh, 
Anyway, there you go. Anne says, an MRI of the bladder? Well, an MRI, you know, if I get, you know, the, the bladder is a, a hollow organ. It's a hollow organ. It's, you know, think of a hollow orange, you know, it's a fairly, I mean, that actually might be a little bit big. Uh, and so, and uh, uh, you know, it, it would be interesting to see if, if listen, and if, if they can't figure out what the hell's wrong with you, you have every right to ask for imaging. You have every right to ask them to look more. Again, do you have a fibroid tumor pushing on your bladder? An MRI would help spot that. Could you have endometriosis? Could you have a Tarlov cyst? There are a number of other conditions that can mimic all of these symptoms. Even multiple sclerosis could potentially cause some of these symptoms. Uh, then we look at Sjogren's syndrome, which, is, which causes issues with mucous membranes, and the bladder is a mucous membrane organ. So you are an anatomical mystery to be solved and you have the right potentially to ask them to look. You know, when I got my first diagnosis of IC in um, like early 1993 or late 1992, I, I just told the doctor, I don't believe you. I said, I have to be dying. Only cancer could cause the level of pain that I was in. I legitimately thought that I had cancer and was dying. And the pain was so bad. And I just said, I don't believe you. I want you to open me up and look. I want an exploratory. You look at my pelvis. He's like, what? And I'm like, oh, hell yeah, do it. I think I'm dying. I think I have cancer. I want you to look. And he's like, really? And I'm like, yes. He's like, okay. And I had my uh, laparotomy in September of 1993. And uh, by... Dr. Daniel Bennett, no, David Bennett, uh, who performed my hysterectomy 25 years later. Um, and I was stunned when I woke up in the recovery room and he was smiling. He goes, Jill, you don't have cancer. You're fine. You don't have cancer. And I was catastrophizing. I couldn't get it out of my head. I must be dying of cancer. I must be dying of cancer. I've been thinking that for months. And I, I, of course, I didn't even, I mean, they had done a urine cytology. It was negative, but I was just, the pain was so severe, it kind of makes you a little wonky. And so when he finally said that, it was like, okay, I can let that go. Now we're going to focus. Now we're going to focus on the bladder. So I, it's okay to ask for additional testing. If you, 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 you're, 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 as long as you're willing to pay for it or your health insurance will pay for it, I think it's okay to ask for it. Lisa said, would you use bladder builder, allopath, and PRL together? No, of course not. No, 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 no. Bladder builder, bladder builder already has the PEA in it. And it doesn't have aloe in it because so many, there are patients out there who can be aloe intolerant. So you could do the bladder builder See how you do with that for a couple of weeks. And then if you wanted to add the, the allopath to it, yeah, I guess you could do that. But, you know, again, I, I come from a less is more. I don't like the idea of adding on top of it, on top of each other, because then you never know what you're reacting to. And we need to try to understand if you're having a reaction. So, so um, I would be a little bit careful. I don't think I would, I personally would do that. And again, that's a good question for you, doctor. Becky says, thank you for reminding us of the hope of remission. Exactly. Uh, Michelle says, do you believe the theory that Sjogren's and interstitial cystitis go hand in hand? Yeah, I do. I think there is another subtype, a small subset of patients who do have an autoimmune process going on. And that's characterized by having uh, lupus or Sjogren's um, and potentially interstitial cystitis. It just has not been defined. It has not been defined clearly, but I, I do think that that's a, an, another small subtype. And that's what Dr. Payne wrote in his proposal for his five subtypes. He said, there are, we're going to be doing more. Um, there will be more. The challenge is that nationally, doctors aren't ready to go more. So at that part of the national level, it's like bladder centric beyond bladder. That's all they're willing to say. Whereas Chris Payne is saying in bladder centric is going to be subtype one, subtype two, 
Beyond bladder is going to be three, four, five, pelvic floor, pudendal neuralgia, central sensitization. And maybe the auto, I don't know where the autoimmune would fit, to be quite honest. It would be, it would fit in both. But I do think there's, we know from research that there is a small, very small subset of patients, but it's a real subset of patients who do have Sjogren's and lupus with IC. So they are clearly their own unique group, just like there is a real small subset of patients with Lyme disease. And that Lyme disease, uh, the bacteria in the, from the Lyme disease can also be found in the bladder wall. Is it a bacteria or a virus? I think it's a bacteria. I know I did a public service announcement about it several years ago. And it's right here. It's right there. It's just not coming. <laughs> it will pop out of my brain randomly in about five or 10 minutes. Mandy says, I've been referred to pain management, but I don't tolerate opiates. Is it normal to be referred to pain management? Any idea what they can do? I think it's a good idea. Why not? Because, you know, number one, they're very, very good at trying to determine where your pain is coming from because there's muscle pain, there's organ pain, and there's nerve pain. So if you're having nerve pain, they can do a nerve block to, 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 not only make your original diagnosis to make a, a diagnosis, but also therapeutically. Um, and so having another set of eyes looking at your body, trying to understand your body, I'm all for that. Um, and that, you know, the challenge here is you, that you don't tolerate opiate medications well. So no, so you're not interested in going that route. And so it will be very interesting to see what else they might have in their, in their toolkit that might help you. And again, you know, looking at something, you really should look at the research for palmitoethanolamide, PEA, and I will type that in and where you can research it, because this has been, the variant of this has been used and studied in Europe with many, many pain conditions. And the research is very exciting, very promising. It's a simple fatty acid, very easy on the body. And um, that would be something very interesting for you to consider trying. Haley said, would Lyme disease be detected with next generation urine testing? I would assume it would be. Heather says, I have a friend who came out of remission due to shingles, right? Nerves that are getting irritated. Yeah. Chimera says, I use Travel John's camping. I grab a quart Ziploc bag, put, a, put one Travel John, one paper towel, three squares of pea paper and a hand sanitizer. Everything goes into the zip bag. Trash with no fear of a spill. Chimera, perfect. Okay, so there's what she does. She's got a quart Ziploc bag. She puts in, she puts in one travel john, one paper towel, a couple of squares of toilet tissue, and a hand sanitizer wipe. She does her business, puts it all in the bag, zips it up, throws it in the trash can. There you go. I mean, it's just hard. I, I hate seeing plastic go into, you know, the our um, landfills, but. You got to do what you got to do. If you have the ability of uh, peeing behind a bush, that's probably more environmentally friendly. But having hand sanitizer wipes and toilet paper, good to go. Becky says, I've been battling all year. I've been losing hope of feeling good again. Becky, so if you're not responding to therapy, we have to take a step back and revisit the diagnosis. It'd be very interesting for you to read our new book, IC101. It's not just a bladder disease uh, because this goes over some of the, the variants, the misdiagnosis, mistaken diagnosis, and things like that. We want to try to get a second look at your pelvis to see what we're missing, what they're missing. You know, again, it could be something as simple as a broken tailbone healed out of position that could be the cause of some of this. Uh, Sandy says, uh, what do you do for an age related flare due to lack of estrogen? Well, so if you have a, and Sierra says the book is good. Thank you, Sierra. Thank you so much. Heather asks, is MAP continuing? As far as I know it is. Okay, so if you're having a bladder wall flare because of estrogen atrophy, you're gonna follow the bladder wall flare protocol. 
Um, and so what do we do? So number one, you have to understand that your bladder can't defend itself right now because it doesn't have enough estrogen to produce mucus. So you have to understand that what you put in your mouth and what you eat or drink have the have a greater potential of irritating your bladder than when they went than 20 years ago. So diet modification is really, really important for somebody with estrogen atrophy. So no coffee, no green tea, no black tea, no soda, no cranberry juice, no orange juice, no energy drinks, right? You got to step way back on the chemical irritants to your bladder. Um, but let's just say you did it. You went out with your friends and you had a couple of glasses of wine or alcohol or whatever. You went out for coffee and had a couple cups of coffee and your bladder is screaming at you now. So you're going to do our typical bladder wall rescue plan. So the first thing you would do is drink water to dilute your urine, right? So drink a, one or two glasses of water. Let's see if we can dilute the irritants in your urine. The second thing you might do is do um, alkalinize your urine with a couple of pre-leaf or a Tums, right? So pre-leaf, it's calcium blue sulfosphate. It's It will reduce... Uh, uh, extraneous acid in your urine. It's remarkably effective. And in some cases, two or three capsules can reduce 95% of the acid found in like a cup of tomato sauce or a cup of coffee, something like that. You have to look at their acid formulas, but pre-leaf can be remarkably successful at alkalinizing your urine. If you don't have pre-leaf, you can do Tums or you can do maybe a quarter teaspoon of baking soda in a big glass of water. Don't want to use a lot of baking soda because that's sodium and that can raise your heart, that can raise your blood pressure. So it's really going to be the calcium Tums and only in emergencies, maybe the sodium bicarbonate. So we're going to alkalinize your urine. Again, you're going to have to wait an hour, see how you do. If that's, you're still not responding, the next thing you can do is do a um, over-the-counter azo bladder pain relief tablet. Okay, azo. You can get this in most stores, most Walgreens. We have it in the IC Network shop too. Urinary pain relief tablet. So this is the over-the-counter version of Pyridium. So what it does is it acts to numb your bladder wall. So this is viable. And Heating pad on your belly so that you're not letting your muscles get all tight. And, and you, you're gonna have to, then you pretty much have to ride it out for 24 to 48 hours. But if it's not responding to there, if it's not responding at all, you can call your doctor and ask for a rescue installation, which is heparin lidocaine to turn the flare off. Um, that's pretty much a bladder wall rescue plan. Um, If you come on over to the IC Network website and you sign up for our uh, mailing list, you get our 40 page flare management guide, which has our hour by hour rescue plans. And they're also in our new book, IC 101. You can get them there too. Uh, the book is available through amazon.com, through the IC Network. It's also available on Kindle. The Audible is slowly in progress. Thank you for the 50 stars, Amanda. I really appreciate it. Michelle says, cyclosporin actually helped me with the IC and helped with the Sjogren's, but it also caused issues with my kidneys. Cyclosporin is a step five treatment option. It is considered a bit of a miracle drug uh, for patients who have some sort, any sort of autoimmune issues, uh, but it comes with a host of pretty severe side effects, which is why it's a step five treatment option. Thank you, Heather. Hey, for those of you who have read IC 101, would you please go over on go over onto Amazon and give us a review? Uh, I really appreciate it. I have uh, um, the more patient stories we can get. You know, like here's the deal. My favorite people in the world are people who help me be better. I love it if people can. Uh, give me new ideas. If I'm doing something wrong that they tell me, hey, Jill, did you know this might be better? I love it when people come to me with peace in peace and they just, we just want to work together. Um, I, so I welcome every amount of feedback that I can get from the IC, you know, for IC 101, because it is our, 
our first big book. Um, we're going to have a big uh, second edition next year with a lot of case studies in it, provided I find the time to write up the freaking case study. Um, and uh, I just want to know what we can do better. You know, I, I understand that not everybody agrees with me. I understand, for example, that the, the chronic embedded infection people really disagree with what I'm saying. They want everybody to believe I see is a chronic embedded infection, and I, I couldn't disagree with that more. Uh, you cannot, we cannot make broad statements about IC that's too diverse. You know, I, I don't have a chronic infection. I have central sensitization, IC subtype 5. For me, taking antibiotics would be a complete waste of time, which it was when we did that. What I don't like, and I kind of started off this meeting about this early on, is there are some people who are just plain mean. There are some people online who, uh, you know, they're so... Um, uh, they, they so love the anonymity of the web that they, you know, can say very cruel, hurtful things. I, I, you know, so I had somebody say that I was a pathetic excuse for a woman that apparently because I'm childless, nobody wants me and that I'm, you know, caring for my decrepit parents I mean, I've gotten some really disgraceful email, but I understand that that's part of the, you know, when you're the spokesperson, you, you got to take your lumps. I'm used to critics. Um, I, I'm usually very good about not taking it personally, but um, I think that when we work together and we support each other and when we help each other, we're going to get much farther than if people send poison, poison pen letters, right? Um, Mandy says, does your book offer an audible form? Yes, it will eventually offer an audible form. We also now already have our first major change in the book, which is a new foreword by Dr. Robert Eckenberg. So, um, uh, I stopped, we stopped recording the audible when he said he wanted to write and expand his foreword because he, uh, had some new information to share. Amanda says, I've been having many flares since I was six days, six years old that lasted a day or two. Now at 31, it was hit. It is hit and doesn't seem to want to go away. My main symptom is burning my urethra. It went away for two days and just hit me again tonight. What do you recommend for burning? I started with 10 milligrams amitriptyline. I took turmeric, omega-3, D3. Uh, they do not know what type. So, and thank you so much for your 200 stars, Amanda. So, so listen, my, I didn't have bladder pain until I was 32. Okay, it was the first time I ever had bladder pain. So, and it was stunning. You know, it's like, oh my God, like literally overnight, overnight, everything changes. Like I was training for a triathlon one day and the next day I could barely walk. And it's so confusing. It's so confusing and scary. And it's like, oh my God, what the hell is wrong with me? Um. I have a blog on our website, The Seven Causes of Urethral Pain. And I want you to go over to our website, icnetwork.org, and, and search for that blog. We're going to be looking at a couple of different things. Number one, the quality and health of your skin. If you're on birth control at the age of 31, it may be that the birth control has dropped your estrogen level so low that it is affecting the health of your skin down there. And the urethra is the canary in the coal mine when it comes to changes in estrogen, right? Changes in estrogen. So the concept number one is what is the health of my skin down there? And is there anything weird? And again, if you're on birth control, that's going to be something suspicious. Or if you've had, if you're on chemical menopause for endometriosis, if you're taking Lupron, something like that, then we would expect that you would have some urethral issues from losing that estrogen. Uh, you could have a chemical sensitivity. Uh, have you recently changed laundry detergents or fabric softeners? Um, 
especially the fact that you had flares when you were six years old, that kind of implies that you, you might have inherited some sensitivity like me. I could never use bubble bath as a kid. Um, I had a lot of issues with my, with my skin. Um, I, I, that's like my thing, my whole life, my skin is super, super sensitive. So uh, I would want to know if you change laundry detergent, change soap, change fabric softener, anything like that, which could be triggering you. Um, there is a gland halfway up the urethra called the periurethral gland. It is like a sea sponge wrapped on, along the outside. So your urethra is kind of like the size of your little finger. So about halfway up on the outside, it's a little brown gland that is what we call a homologue to the male prostate. In other words, when they compare the tissue, our periurethral gland matches male prostate tissue. So what does that mean? We have a prostate. Fem women have a prostate. So um, uh, like the male prostate, the drainage ducts are very, they're very tiny, they're microscopic. So it's very easy for you to get an infection uh, inside this periurethral gland. And because the drainage ducts are blocked, it becomes the equivalent of a deep pimple by the pelvis, I mean, by the urethra. But that's something that you can easily rule out. Number one, these, these deep pimples hurt with sex. So as a penis is going into the vagina, about an inch in, it will hit that infected gland and that will hurt. So if you have pain on entry, that would be concept number one. You know, and then um, uh, concept number two is you could potentially use your finger if you wash your hands really well, put a glove on and just insert your finger in your vagina and just gently touch along the front edge because your urethra is in front of your vagina. And again, not far, you know, just like this much. If you feel any deep little mini lumps like a pimple, a little tender pimple, you could have an infected periurethral gland. And if that, if that is the case, they have to drain that gland. Um, there are some other things, uh, tight pelvic floor muscles. If your pelvic floor muscles are really, really tight, let's see here. Let me grab this for a moment. So let us look at, let us look at the pelvic floor for a moment. Hello, pelvis. Hello, Mr. Hips, right? So you've got three layers of muscles in, in, these, in your pelvic floor muscles. The bottom layer is this layer, right? Right, so there you go. So what makes the levator ani muscles, which are the bottom part of the pelvic floor muscles, so unique in the human body, is that they are involved with, with three major bodily functions. There are three holes in, leva in the levator muscles, a hole for your urethra, a hole for your vagina, and a hole for your rectum. But you can see that if you have sustained a muscle injury and these muscles tighten, they're gonna squeeze the urethra, they're gonna squeeze the vagina, and they're gonna squeeze the rectum. So if you feel like you're, you're peeing through a needle, um, that kind of means, or if you can't start your urine stream right away, or you hesitate 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 seconds before you can release urine, then you got tight levator muscles. And that's the correct therapy for that would be pelvic floor physical therapy. So carry hope in your heart. You know, you are an anatomical mystery to be solved. Sandy, thank you for that. 99 stars. I appreciate that. Bethany, oh, thank you, honey. Carla, thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words. I really appreciate that. Lisa says, do blood pressure medicines affect the bladder? And the answer is yes. There are, there are some patients who flare. Why do I keep, oh, you know, is it steam? I, my glasses are just being so annoying today. Let me put my thing on it. There are some patients who struggle with blood pressure medications. Every now and then I take a low pressure. I get a little um, irregular heartbeat um, every now and then. 
Um, and if that happens to me, I take a quarter or a half of a low presser and it's never flared me, but I've never had to take it um, every day. So you're not alone if you're having an issue with blood pressure medications. It's fairly common. Kyrie says, Japanese matcha tea. I cut it to one scoop and 32 ounces of water. Do it four drinks. It's actually helped a lot with my flares. Interesting. I don't know anything about matcha, hun. Is it caffeinated? You're eating tomatoes again, but you're cutting out all seeds. Why? The seeds are not acidic. It's the it's the tomato juice and meat that's going to be acidic. But the good news is you, they're not bothering you. So that's good. All righty. You know, some people ask the question, Does is everybody diet sensitive? And the answer is no, absolutely not. If you're pelvic floor driven, you're not going to, you're probably not going to be diet sensitive unless you've been pelvic floor driven for a very, very, very long time. And we're now dealing with ischemia in the bladder and the bladder wall failing because it's not getting good blood supply. Heather says, I found this the most stressful part of, of bladder conditions. There's so much controversy in the patient population about the cause. It's so stressful. Yeah. My greatest worry as a support group leader was that I would accidentally discourage a patient from trying the one thing that might have helped them. And so I try to be very neutral and balanced. I do. I do try as much as I can to be neutral. I might, my job is to give you information education, pros and cons, and then get you to start reading a little bit more too. Pam said, I went to pain management. They did not believe I'm constantly in pain, no pain flares. That's unfortunate. Apparently they're not the pain management team for you. And you're not the first that that's happened to. Chimera says, you've set your place in history for helping thousands of patients. It would be hard to hit the jackpot, have a kid that you could, and have a kid that could grow up to help as many people. Oh, thank you, honey. Megan says, it's better to see a sex therapist if, if pain during and after intercourse doesn't go away. Basic physical therapy was suggested. I'm starting that soon. You know, I think a sex therapist would kind of help you navigate this. It might help you give you some ideas on how to approach your partner when you're struggling with this, what to do, what not to do, how to communicate more effectively. But a sex therapist isn't going to work with your muscles. A physical therapist does. So I think you really need to give the physical therapy a shot. There's a really good book called Secret Suffering. Let me find it here. Here it is. Secret Suffering. This was written by Dr. Robert Eckenberg, and who is our top pelvic pain expert in the country as a gynecologist and a patient, Susan Bilheimer. And um, so this is a really, really good book for any couple that's struggling with uh, painful intimacy. And there's just t a ton of suggestions, a ton of great suggestions in this book. Definitely worth trying. Hey guys, I need to take a quick bio break. So let's do this. Everybody run to the bathroom. I'll meet you back in a minute or two.
Alrighty then. Alrighty then. You know, um, one of the really interesting symptoms of having tight pelvic floor muscles is that you feel, sometimes you feel like there's a, um, a, a drop of urine in your urethra or a little piece of stool in your rectum, even if it's empty, it feels like there's something there. Or it can feel like there's something in your vagina. It's so weird. It's so weird. Um, so I uh, sometimes after having a bowel movement, I don't feel like I'm empty all the way, but I am empty. But I don't feel like that. And at least for me, um, especially sitting as I do, like I'm doing right now, um, my muscles get tighter and tighter and I'm going back to physical therapy on Wednesday. And I'm really excited to do it because now, like right now, I have, I have discomfort like, let's see if I can, like my discomfort right now is like right here. It's not on my rectum. It's like over to the side on, on these muscles over here. And um, I'm, just, I'm just really anxious to learn some good new stretches to try to get these muscles uh, normal again. I mean, like I have an SI problem. My, my SI joint's unstable. So my muscles are always tight on that side and it's annoying as hell. I want my muscles to be normal, but they will never be normal until I can get my SI joint fixed. And the longer I sit, the worse it gets. And so, it, you know, it's just like, like yesterday for an hour, I was doing everything I could do just to try to calm things down, which I did. And then I went about my day and I did what I did for the day. But it's like every single day, at least for me, I know I have to work on it. I have to work on those. Uh, Michelle says, I was told Kegels are true for interstitial, are terrible for patients with interstitial cystitis. Absolutely. Yes. You never do Kegel exercises if you have pelvic floor dysfunction at tight muscles, because what does a Kegel do? Kegels are for incontinence. So Kegels are for people who have muscles so weak, they're leaking urine and stool. Uh, Kegel, so, but an IC patient, we have exactly the opposite problem. Our muscles are so tight that they're not releasing and relaxing. They're lifting actually this isn't exactly the right example, but normally your, your levator muscles um, and your internal pelvic floor muscles are flat along the bone and they kind of um, provide the foundation, not foundation. Well, anyway, they, they, they just kind of are the first thing above the bone. But what happens when they get tight is they do this. They lift and they tighten. And when they lift, they start interfering with other things. So our goal with therapy is really to get these muscles to flatten and get back to where they are. And, and a physical therapist, and again, this isn't an anatomically correct example, but it's pretty close. So a physical therapist is going to use their hand and go the length of the muscle. And they're just gonna try to get that muscle to release and relax, right? So the best physical therapy for somebody with pelvic floor tension is a finger touching them. It's not about biofeedback. That's used for people who have to, really for people with incontinence who are learning how to isolate those muscles and contract those muscles. For us, you can see how useful a muscle, a finger, touching the length of these muscles. You get it? See this? Look at how far we can get in. 
So it's about a finger going the length of the muscle, or they might push on a trigger point, or they might go crossways. They might do this, right? That's another way of doing that. And so obviously it's hard for us to use our finger. We're not going to be able to get that far. So we use on we use a glass wand. And so this is the Easy Magic uh, wand by Icy Relief. This is uh, my favorite one. We're sold out right now. We have the bigger ones, but you know, this whole supply chain issue is hard. So if, if you're doing this on your own, you're probably going to be using a wand that looks like this. You can use a straight wand too, but I think these are better. We have the straight ones also. And you can see how easy it is to use a wand vaginally or rectally. And this will allow you to work on these muscles. This is what I do weekly, sometimes every day, depending upon how it is. And right now, my muscle tension is really located, like right... Oops, it would help if I put it on backwards. I mean, correctly, not backwards. My mo Most of my tension right now is just like right here in these muscles. Oh, life, right? If it's not one thing, it's another. Don't be afraid of using something like this. You just have to learn how to use it. Um, and, and, and I guess what I have found over time in the first year or so, I mean, the first couple of times I did it in the first year, and I did it very rarely, I just didn't understand it. I was just like, I was sticking it in there and poking around, didn't make any sense to me. And my physical therapist kept saying, Jill, move it in a J shape. I'm like, I don't understand the J shape. I do not understand the J shape. Help me understand it. Well, it is a J shape. And you, and you can see it here. It is a J. It is, whoops. If I stick my hand in the right spot, you can see it's a J. Here's the small side of the J and there's the tall side of the J. It is exactly a J shape on both sides. So when you kind of understand when you're laying there on your back and you're trying to do it, it really is a J shape. And what they do is they, if you visualize your rectum or your vagina as a clock, you've got noon, six, three and, and nine. Um, you're, you're never pushing up against your bladder. You're always working below here instead. And, and, and you, you know you've got the right muscle if when you push on it and work on it, you feel that sensation you might feel when you're going to have a bowel movement. You're not going to have a bowel movement. It just means you're pushing on the right muscle. And so that's where a lot of my tension is right now. It's right in that group of muscles. So it's going to be really interesting to see what the physical therapist says. I've seen her I've known her for years now. She's been so wonderful to me, teaching me so that I can teach you guys and so that I can just work. Um, uh, Kyrie says, I'm only allowed to walk and dance. Body groove has so many options that don't hurt and you do it at your pace. Any effect, anything that affects the core and regular exercise, I never go and won't go to the gym. I walk in my house. You know, again, working with a physical therapist. Uh, we talked about matcha tea. It does have caffeine. You know, if you got central sensitization, caffeine is never good, no matter the form. Lisa says, I'm sensitive to almost all foods. I'm down to eating six or so that I can eat. So Lisa, we have to understand your anatomy for that. We have to understand why your bladder is so sensitive. And the odds are, I bet you, you have Hunter's lesions. I bet you've got Hunter's lesions, hon. If I'm exposed to any caffeine, my heart races. So even if it's natural caffeine, I can't touch it with a 10-foot pole. I will end up in the ER as I did a year ago. Mandy says, question, they keep referring, referring me to physical therapy, but nobody does pelvic floor therapy. Should I ask to see a massage therapist who specializes in uh, my, yeah. well, you just, you have to keep searching until you find one who has the right training. 
The Herman Wallace Institute is the uh, institute that does the pelvic floor certification. They have a website, hermanwallace.org. Herman, like Herman's Hermits. Boy, that dated me. Anybody remember Herman's Hermits? Herman's, Her, wait, wait, Herman's Hermits? Is that their name? That British rock group? That old British rock group. Uh, we have a database on our website. We have a link to all the other groups where you can go search, including the International Pelvic Pain Society. And Mandy, if you tell me where you are, I can look in our database right now. Let me just go ahead and open it up. And for anybody now who wants a referral in their state, let me open up this database from Harvard. And let's see if... Uh, we can find somebody for you. I just have to open up the right file here. Not my wellness coaching records. No, that's not the right file. Pelvic pain providers in the USA. That, my friends, is the right file. Enable macros. Yes. We are enabling macros. No, no, no. Yes. Okay. Okay. So Mandy's in Rockford, Illinois. All right. So let's see who I got, who we have in Illinois. So hold on a sec. Um, all right. So Mandy, there's a ton of pelvic floor physical therapists in Illinois, um, including the queen, the goddess of pelvic floor work, Rhonda Cotterinos, who is at Cotterinos Physical Therapy in Chicago, Illinois, Oak Brook Terrace and Vernon Hills. So Cotterinos Physical Therapy, she is the one who 20 years ago went to the urology conferences and said, hey, guys, can we do pelvic floor work? And she now, they laughed at her 20 years ago. Now she teaches them. So um, um, uh, let me just read off some cities and you tell me, Mandy, if any of these are close to you. Arlington Heights, Buffalo Grove, Chicago, Vernon Hills, Oak Brook Terrace, Evanston, Gurney, Highland Park. Lockport, Moline, Naperville, Plainfield, Palos Heights, Peoria. Oh, here's one in Rockford. Mercy, the Mercy Health Physician Clinic. The physical therapist is Kelly Hicks. Kelly Hicks, H-I-X. And there's one in Wheaton, Illinois. All right, Michelle's asking about uh, New York. Let me go to New York. All right, so you're in Albany or Saratoga. So let me take a look here. There's a ton in New York. A ton like dozens. The list is huge. All right. The very first one, Therapeutic Evolution Physical Therapy is in Albany, New York. The name of the physical therapist is Laura Purificato, P-U-R-I-F-I-C-A-T-O. Albany, New York, Therapeutic Evolution Physical Therapy. Okay, zip codes don't help, guys. Uh, I, I, this is not a, a database searchable by zip code. Uh, Judy says, Bellingham, Washington. All right, let's go to Washington. Washington does have a, a IC research center in the Seattle area. So do you want, Judy, do you want a physical therapist or a urologist? Who are you looking for? Uh, Veronica says, I have my first CT scan with dye this week. What information will this provide in regards to my bladder? I've been having a lot of back pain as well as urgency frequency. Well, a CT scan with dye, 
Oh, I had that done. Um, I can't, I, you know, CT scan, CT scans are not part of the diagnostic workup for IC and the AUA guidelines. It's really about kind of ruling other stuff out. Um, it'll be interesting to see if it finds anything. Um, are they doing avoiding cystogram? Or, or I, I think when I had it done, they were testing for kidney function. Um, Kyrie says, can you talk about buffered vitamin C? I got COVID last November and it hung on for three months. My team of doctors have advised me against the vaccination. Citrus is not anything is not anything in my diet, but it's flu season already. And if buffered vitamin C is safe, I'd like to try it. Well, you can try buffered vitamin C. Buffered vitamin C is made from calcium ascorbate rather than ascorbic acid. Uh, it's known as ester C. I think we have it in the IC Network store. Um, uh, just understand that um, some people might be a little bit too sensitive to that too. I would just you know try one and see how you do with it. Lisa said, how do, your, how do Hunter's lesions heal? Uh, sometimes they heal completely spontaneously, completely spontaneously. And um, we don't know why, they just heal. Other, other times, with the, whatever dysfunction, like, you know, again, like a rotated uterus, um, it's called posterior fornix syndrome when that gets repaired and there's no longer pressure on that nerve. So apparently that's why that woman's patient's lesions heal. Um, and if it's a viral infection, then an antiviral might heal that lesion. All right, so Judy is a physical therapist in Bellingham. All right, let me look. Oh, yeah. Core physiotherapy in Bellingham, Washington. There are one, two, three, four, five physical therapists who do pelvic floor work there. Core physiotherapy. And at 3232 Squalicum Parkway in Bellingham, the physical therapists are Elizabeth, Christine, Angela, Caitlin, and Evie. So again, CORE, C-O-R-E, physical therapists. Let me just see if there's anything else here. The big database. And, you know, y'all can call me over the week and we can look it up, too, if you don't want to do it online. Yep, that's what we got. Uh, Veronica says, just having a tilted uterus contribute to IC symptoms? Absolutely. If, you're, if your uterus is tilted onto your bladder, yes, it could. Cheryl, I don't know why you said lemonade. What have I missed here? A tilted uterus could easily irritate the bladder and cause problems, no doubt about that. Kyrie, I feel like I've missed something with what you just wrote there. This is our group. Why is there a problem? Let me see if I can address whatever problem that might be. Because we want to be proactive and nip stuff in the bud. We don't want anything to hurt anybody's feelings. I do not see it. All right. All right, guys. Well, listen, we have been doing this for uh, three hours now. Time flies. Time flies. Uh, Judy says, what's the best, the best way to reach me is by phone after noon Pacific time because I'm doing elder care in the morning. Uh, so I usually work from noon until I work from noon to 
five, then I take a walk, fix dinner, and then I come back to work. And I'm usually working from like seven to 11 at night. My schedule is all messed up. Uh, and our phone number, our 800 number, 1-800-928-7496, 1-800-928-7496. Uh, do not call on Mondays. Mondays are my only day off a week. And um, I, I really try to uh, use that time to find my sanity again. <laughs> Uh, Lisa says, I didn't have Hunter's lesions last time to check, but I've been on a lot of antibiotics since then, and my doctor didn't want to check again because UTIs are why I'm in so much pain. I've taken Dexlucan in a meeting to avoid feeding yeast infection. I did the next-gen test and treated E. coli. Any next steps? Well, Lisa, you know, again, we have to really try to understand why you're having recurring UTI, right? Is it because of estrogen atrophy? I mean, the number one reason why women get recurring UTI as they're older is because um, their body can't defend themselves. I attended a lecture by Dr. Anthony Schaefer at a National Institute of Health meeting that covered this topic. And they spent a lot of time trying to understand why some women kept getting infection over and over and over and over again. And so they took urine samples every day. They took vaginal swabs every day. And they made a fairly remarkable discovery. And that is that 24 hours before the bacteria arrived in the bladder, it was living quite happily in the vagina. And this then led the, the um, researchers to go, well, wait a second. What's happened to vaginal defenses? Why has the vagina become a safe haven for bacteria? And the answer comes right back to aging and estrogen atrophy. And so generally for an older woman who's getting recurring infections, you don't just get the antibiotic. They normally also put you on estrogen, uh, estrogen cream in the vagina to try to boost your self defenses. We've got to improve the quality and health of their skin there and try to get some more mucus in there so it doesn't become a happy place for bacteria. One of the other things that happens as we get older is the pH changes and it also becomes more hospitable. Um, if you're having recurring E. coli infection, there are a couple of over-the-counter things that you could do. You could do D-mannose. Um, the one that we have is... This is the one that I like, My Daily Demanos by Natural Approach Nutrition. Really love this formula. So d the cool thing about Demanos, so mannose is a sugar. Think glucose, sucrose, mannose. But it is a sugar that the human body does not use and cannot use. So when you swallow Demanos, it is immediately excreted into your urine. The cool thing about D-mannose is it has a shape, a receptor that matches a receptor on E. coli. And so when you've got mannose in your urine, the E. coli attach to it. And then when you urinate, you pee them out. And so D-mannose has been around for many, many years, and it has been found to be marginally helpful in preventing the recurring E. coli infection. But we also have more research now that shows that an ingredient called proanthocyanidins, also known as PACs, that comes from cranberry, is even more effective than D-mannose at, at preventing E. coli infection. And this is not acidic cranberry juice. This is just one ingredient. So there are two over-the-counter supplements on the market that are the most well-known for helping to prevent recurring UTI. One is called Ellura, E-L-L-U-R-A, or Prevent. P-R-V-N-T. And we have Prevent. The challenge with Allura is it's just too expensive. It can be like $125 a month, whereas this one is like $60 a month. Prevent. So the Prevent, has, not only does it have the Demanos, but it has the PACs, but it also has some important vitamins in it, including a buffered vitamin C, um, and it has some probiotics in it. And so this actually prevent is the biggest seller for natural approach nutrition. They were asked to create this by Ken Peters, an IC researcher at Royal Oak, Michigan, who wanted a more affordable, more affordable UTI prevention. 
So prevent is the blowout seller for natural approach to nutrition. It's uh, quite a few patients use it. Um, so, so you could look at that as an option to help you prevent recurring UTI if it's E. coli based. How do you get an estrogen suppository that doesn't burn? Well, honey, the reason they're burning is because your skin is dry. So they're going to burn for the first week or two until your skin starts to produce more estrogen so that it can defend itself. So that, you know, once you get more mucus in there, it, the burning will get less and less and less because, you know, the other chemicals in it are not reaching those nerves. So it's all about mucus. Uh, Veronica says, follow up to my question, hysterectomy would help but not guarantee to take away the IC? No, no, no. Absolutely not. Hysterectomy would not take away IC. Different organs. We had a lot of patients, including my co-founder, Diane, Diane Manhattan, who had a hysterectomy when she was like 21. It's heartbreaking because she never needed to have a hysterectomy. It wasn't her uterus. It was her bladder. And we have one case of a woman, a young woman who had a completely inappropriate hysterectomy because the gynecologist didn't listen to the urologist and she ended up getting a million dollars or so as a payoff because they robbed her of her perfectly normal uterus. So no, hysterectomy would not help a bladder wall issue. What it could do though, is it might remove a fibroid tumor that's pushing on your bladder. Of course, the downside of a hysterectomy is a surgery and it's traumatic and it's gonna affect your pelvic floor muscles. So absolutely not. Hysterect you, hysterectomy is only performed if you have a problem with your uterus uh, or your ovaries like me. You know, I mean, I had precancer. So uh, Joseph says, as an intermediate dancer, how should I have my pelvis during bowel pains? Thank you so much. You know, Joseph, you got to, uh, what kind of dance do you do? Are you doing ballet? The challenge with dancing is that you're, you end up, you're either taught to tighten your pelvic floor, especially with ballet. Think about it. You tuck your butt under and you walk with your butt tucked under and your legs out. That is the ballet walk, right? That is the jazz walk too. And that's just not healthy. It's just not normal. The, the pelvic floor muscles are not meant to be rotated under. Uh, think about your tailbone for a moment. Your, your, uh, then think about a, uh, a, uh, a dog wagging a tail, right? So a happy dog, well, you know, you, you got a, a tail that's up and wagging and happy. A dog that is scared, the tail's between their legs and tucked under. That is just not normal. So um, it's important to try to keep your hips level. It's important to after you're done dancing, that you do some additional stretches to try to restore proper, uh, you know, that would be just a really good question for somebody like um, Amy Stein or Nicole Cozian or uh, Rhonda Cotterinos. I'm sure that there are some exercises that you could do that would help to get those muscles out of tension. I mean, this dancing puts tremendous tension on those pelvic floor muscles. Anne says, what's the SI joint? The SI joint is the joint that connects your hip bone to your sacrum. So here's your spinal cord, right? So we've got a spinal cord. And at the base of the spinal cord, you have right here, whoops, right here, a triangular piece of bone called your sacrum. And, uh, and if your sacrum is also what anchors your hip joints. So your SI joint is the joint that connects the sacrum with the hip bone. It's right here. Can you see that? It's right there and it's right there. On the back side, it's right in here. This joint is meant to be very firm and stable because your hips need to be firm and stable. When this joint starts to move, it can be chaos. SI, SI dysfunction can cause sciatica. You know, the challenge here too is that 
your pudendal nerve emerges from these holes on both sides in four sections. And then they merge into one section about here. And then they go through the Alcox canal, which is a little canal that goes through structures. And then when it emerges from the Alcox canal somewhere, somewhere down here, it then breaks up into pieces again and innervates everything from your clitoris to your rectum. So the SI joint is, if you have piriformis syndrome, if you've got sciatica pain shooting down your leg, we're going to be looking at your SI joint. If you are a racket sports player, the SI dysfunction is a classic injury of somebody who played racket sports. I was a, prof oh, was it too low? I'm sorry. Let me try it again. All right. Is that better? My Facebook camera is above this camera. All right. So again, here you go. Spinal cord, right? At the base of your spinal cord is your sacrum. It's a triangular piece of bone with the four holes on each side. And it is what connects your hip bones, right? And so can you see this joint right here and this joint on this side? That's the SI joint, sacroiliac joint. Hopefully you could see it there. Did you get it, Mandy? Did you did it make sense? I hope so. I hope it does. All right. Uh last call for questions. Last call for questions. I'm happy to take any other questions. It is, oh, it is raining. Yes, the drought is broken. We are supposed to have rain all week this week. And you know what that means? The end of fire season. Hallelujah, praise God. Oh, God, you have no idea what it's like being always worrying about fires and Yes. Oh my God, it's raining. Oh. Time for a rain dance. That's exciting. Like seriously, that's exciting. How do I feel about marshmallow routine? Does it help with burning? Worth a shot. It's worth a shot. Um, some people tend to be a little irritated by marshmallow. I mean, we've known that from day one. But but you know, it would be interesting to see if it if if it helped. It could. It could. Um, my sister, as an example, um, uh, has been struggling with uh, UTI, and she was she ended up with she was ended up giving a formula a tea formula that we're going to carry in our store. That had marshmallow root, and it helped her tremendously. So I'm worth a shot. Uh, Michelle said the D-manos you showed is it a powder? Yes, it is a powder. It is made by Natural Approach Nutrition. It is called My Daily D Manos. My Daily D Manos. You know, there's a lot of D Manos on the market. You could probably get it in a local health food store too. Um, I when I pick products for the IC network, I, I just really try to go, whoops, with the best companies that I can find. You know, I just want a very, very high quality product if at all possible. And nothing from China. I don't try to use anything that comes from China. It's just, you know, it's it's a crime that they can literally, they can send you, quote unquote, organic vegetables grown in soils contaminated by pesticides and heavy metals. Man, because they didn't spray anything on the plant, even though the soil the plant is growing in is massively contaminated. It's disgraceful. You know, China has destroyed their their ecosystems. Some of their rivers 
um, are just chemical. There's nothing living in them anymore. It's, it's just chemical stew. Um, they're big rivers. I mean, it's just shocking. I, I, I am sick of big business destroying our country, destroying our planet for a buck. They don't care about the next generation. We got to stop that. We are on, we are teetering on losing this planet. And all in the last hundred years, especially the last 50 years. And it is disgraceful. These rich billionaires making money by destroying the rainforests. And oh my God, like seriously, we have got to get back to growing our own food here. Enough with all this crap from China. Enough enough just think you know the senate during the reagan administration passed a law giving tax breaks to companies to send their jobs to china and asia what is it what has this done it's destroyed our middle class we have lost millions of jobs and those freaking companies are making more money and some of them still get tax breaks today because of that old law we need, and you know, like some of the best, the best agricultural fields that grew beautiful food, like in Pennsylvania, were covered with houses. The farmland, the best farmland in the country, covered with houses, covered with malls that are now empty. Enough already. Enough already. It's white chocolate safe, yes. White chocolate is safe. Carob is safe. Oh, and by the way, by the way, you know, we, we sell a ton of carob candy in the IC Network store. We sell Missy J's uh, carob candy. We've got truffly treats. we got carob bars. We've got a bunch more. I have to put them up in the store because they brought on a whole new line. They've got carob brownie mix that they were sold out of. I cannot wait to try. Um, I literally can't have any care of my house. I will eat it all. I am a, I am a monster after dinner. Give me something sweet. And it's so frustrating. I, I'd like to turn that off. It's very, very hard to turn that off. I got organic. I got a little packet of organic. Um, what are those little triangular candies for Thanksgiving, Halloween and Thanksgiving? That's what I had last night. Oh, I wish I could turn that off. But anyway, um, so we have white hot chocolate in our store uh, uh, that you can use. We've got candy cane white hot chocolate. We've got uh, cookies and cream white hot chocolate. And then we got basic white hot chocolate uh, in the IC Network shop. And then we've got the Missy J's stuff, although I got a whole bunch of new ones and I got to put them up. They're not up. So give me a week to do that. Uh, so... Yeah, and then also over Christmas, um, M&M's makes peppermint M&M's with white chocolate. Thank you, candy corn. Yes, thank you, which I normally don't like, but that tells you how crazy I am if I don't have something sweet after dinner. Uh, but anyway, anyway, the, um, the peppermint white chocolate M&M's are to die for. But so are the Missy J's coconut um, coconut almond sea salt truffles, and we've got PBJ truffles that are so good. So give me a week; I will try to get them up. And uh, it's exciting now; it's cool, so we can do that again. And it's raining. Kyrie says, my bro and his best friend left Vegas to be volunteer firefighters in California. Yeah. Well, they just announced a uh, uh, La Nina, which means uh, another year of drought. And uh, Lake Mendocino is almost empty. Lake Sonoma, which serves all of Marin County and half of Sonoma County, is down at, I think it's like 60%. And if we have another year of hard drought, Nobody should be watering their lawns. Uh, all the farms have been cut off from their water, although some of them are watering anyway and paying the fines. It's like, guys, seriously, <laughs> don't keep watering. Don't keep watering now. And just because you're just going to deplete the water faster if we go into another drought and we're in serious drought. 
devastating drought. If we don't have good rain this winter, we're going to be water rationing uh, everything. And Healdsburg right now is 55 gallons per person per day. That's all the water you're meant to, you're allowed to use. Everything is turned off outside. You can't water any anything outside. Nothing. Your lawns are dead. You cannot even use your little, you know, your little sprinkler system. Nothing. Uh, Mandy says, what's the web address for the IC network? icnetwork.org is the easiest way to go there. icnetwork.org. Piece of cake. Marie says, watering the lawn is something very American. We don't do that in Canada. Yeah, I took my I took my lawns out and um, I put in butterfly gardens, but we don't have it was for the monarch butterfly. But they're there. Uh, the last time I had uh, monarch butterfly babies was three years ago. I haven't seen a monarch butterfly in two years. So the monarch butterfly habitat in California has been destroyed uh, primarily along the coast. Um uh, it, with with the big ag agriculture, you know, they've mowed down all the little side fields that had the milkweed that the monarch butterfly lay their eggs on. And so we are, you know, again, this is another perfect example of big business not caring. It's like, open your freaking eyes. Open your eyes. Look at what you've done to this planet. You don't need that extra million dollars. Leave the freaking field alone. We have one winery here, though, Jordan Winery, that is exceptional. And they um, pulled a huge section of their property and, com and converted it into safe habitat for uh, birds, et cetera, et cetera. Judy says, did, where did I get the white chocolate candy corn? Here, let me go get it. So I use the Imperfect Foods Delivery Service. Imperfect Foods uses, delivers food, you know, like potatoes that are too small or too big or whatever. Um, and then you can get a lot of packaged products from there too that are kind of overstocks. Um, so I got this Yum Earth Organic Candy Corn. And it's made with organic cane sugar, organic brown rice syrup, sunflower oil, sea salt, annatto, acacia. Uh, you know, obviously it's not the best thing in the world. I just wanted to try it. And then I also got organic gummy fruits that we'll, we'll, we'll give out for Halloween if we have any Halloween trick-or-treaters. I don't know, gummies kind of upset my stomach a little bit. But my my uh, 92 year old mom uh, really needs things like this that she can getting her to eat is challenging, and she needs her little snack in the afternoon, and she won't eat an apple or things like that. So, hi Sylvian, well, honey, you'll be able to watch it. Yeah, Veronica says, what's the best kind of body wash for cleansing? Boy, do I have a great answer for you, Veronica. Hold on. Okay. You know what they say, do not trust the companies selling you something like douches and all that sort of stuff. Their business is dependent on making you feel like your body is dirty. And in fact, your body is not dirty. One of the really interesting things about the vagina is it's literally kind of the cleanest part of the human body because it sloughs off all the surface cells every four hours. Where did I learn that? In the book, The Vagina Bible by Dr. Jen Gunter. This book is insane. This, listen, you got any girl, teenagers in your family, if you're in your 20s, 30s, get them this book for Christmas. It's wonderful. And it, you'll all laugh when they're opening it. Like, Aunt Jill, really? I gave this to all of my nieces. They looked at me like, really? And I'm like, yeah, it's a great book. Get it. <laughs> Anyway, she has a whole section in here on um, 
on uh, cleansing. And so let's just go there. Hold on. She's got so much in here. I mean, I, I, treating GSM. Uh, here, hold on a sec. Just to give you an idea of what's in this book. Um, uh, the journal, uh, <laughs> the journal of old wives' tales. Why coffee enemas are not good for you. Um, hold on. Internet hygiene. Hold on. I have bleeding after sex. What to do? I have an odor. I have vulvar pain. I have a vulvar itch. I have vaginitis. I have pain with sex. Uh, communicating with your doctor. Symptoms. Pelvic organ progress. She has a chapter in here on UTIs and bladder pain syndrome. Although it's it's she, there's not a lot of room for it. Don't buy this just for, for that discussion. Okay, but uh, skin conditions like lichen sclerosis. If sex hurts, should I keep having it? Man, this book is just incredible. I, I We don't sell it. It's on Amazon if you want it. Um, so hold on. Let me. There's a section on. Oh, what is it? Pubic lice. <laughs> Man, she covers everything. Trichomonas, sexual transmitted disease, herpes, HPV, STI prevention. All right, come on. Cosmetic procedures, injections, and rejuvenation procedures. The FDA did just issue a warning uh, last year about lasering the vagina. Uh, antibiotics and probiotics. Where is it? 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 I guess I could just look at the index, right? Menstrual hygiene. Are there toxins and tampons? Oh, right, here we go. Moisturizers, barriers, and bath products, right? Okay. Hold on. God, it's such a good. She talks about hair removal. Does a vulva need a moisturizer? Should I moisturize preventatively? Uh, what is the best moisturizer? Um, she talks coconut oil, olive oil. V magic, which we we talk about a lot. Products to avoid anything with salicylic acid, any product that claims to brighten the vulva. All right, hold on. Sorry, guys. Razor burn. How to deal with razor burn and ingrown hairs? So good. I love this book. All right, vaginal cleansing. She talks about douching. Multiple studies tell us that douching is harmful. It damages the healthy vaginal bacteria and the protective mucosal layer. This makes a woman more vulnerable to bacterial vaginosis. All right, she goes through all that. Oh, come on. Literally, it's at the front. Vulvar cleansing. All right, here we are. The vulva, like most of the body, medically requires very little, if any, cleansing. I know this is a shock to many people, but how much you wash is personal based on how you were raised, your preferences, where you live, how much dirt you get on your body, and how much you sweat. The only part of your body that medically needs regular cleaning are your teeth and your hands. When we open doors or shake hands or prepare food, we are at risk of transferring virus and bacteria from our hands to our nose. We don't shake hands, eat, or cut raw chicken with our vulvas. 
<laughs> the vulvar cleanliness 101. The main reason women report that they wash their vulvas are order prevention and to feel clean. It is important to remember that the concept of female cleanliness has largely been driven by a male dominated society that for generations, if not longer, have decided that normal female genitals and secretions are dirty. Another driving force is a multi million dollar a year feminine uh, cleaning product industry. Don't kid yourself, they are not here for your health. They're here to make women feel that their normal anatomy is dirty and that feminine freshness is a feeling of confidence, comfort, and cleanliness. Yet this is from an advertisement for a popular product. Many of these ads for these products are barely updated versions of the Lysol douche ads from the 30s and 40s. Oh my God, can you imagine Lysol? Holy hell. <laughs> and she goes, I smell vulvas and vaginas all day long. That is actually part of my job as some vaginal conditions are associated with order. Healthy vulvas don't smell any more than any other body part. I see women who have not showered the day they see me or have come right from the gym and there is no order. Uh, some women are aware of groin order from their uh, apocrine sweat glands, the specialized sweat glands in the, gr the groin and around the anus. This is a genital tract equivalent of armpit odor. <laughs> African <laughs> sweat glands are located deep in hair follicles and secrete sebum, a thick oily substance that becomes part of the acid mantle. Skin bacteria can break down these oils, releasing volatile chemicals with a distinct order. All right. So anyway, washing is most important for women with moderate to severe incontinence. So where to wash? Let's start with where not to wash. The vaginal opening or vestibule is mucosa, meaning it is the same tissue as the inside of your vagina and it does not need to be washed. <laughs> the labia do not have odor producing apocrine sweat glands and the skin on the labia is the thinnest on the vulva and it's the most susceptible to irritation. So a good basic rule is to not put any cleaning product between the labia minora, but water is fine. The groin, the labia majora, which are outer lips, the mons and around the anus that can be washed. So, um, uh, as she, and so getting to the point of your question, which are cleansers, she said, vulvar cleansing has never been studied. That is interesting considering the array of products that claim to be gynecologists tested or approved. What I advise is largely been extrapolated from studies that look at the best way to clean the diaper area of premature and term babies. Uh, obviously it's not a direct comparison, but as the labia minora have thinner skin than the rest of the body and urine and feces are involved, I think that's the best proxy. Water may not completely remove sedum and feces, so some women may want to use something more. However, some skin conditions or skin sensitivities uh, that they find everything irritates and they can only use water. I care for many women with these conditions. As long as they do not have fecal incontinence, there seem to be no health issues. Some women will want to use a cleansing product daily, others a few times a week, and some just after sex. Some will be just fine with water. Um, okay, so there are two different types of products to consider, soap or cleansers. Soap strips away part of the acid mantle, the natural oils and bacteria that are important to its skin defense. If a product is called soap, I don't care how gentle it claims to be, it can dry the skin, which can leave you feeling irritated and possibly more susceptible to microtrauma. The other, uh, other issue with soap is it undergoes a chemical reaction when mixed with water that increases your skin pH to 10 or 11. And remember, the pH of your vulvar skin is acidic around 5.3 to 5.6. But cleansers are not soap. They are synthetic surfactants and other chemicals designed to strip away dirt but leave the acid mantle and skin intact. In general, cleansers are better for your skin than soap. I use cleansers only except on my hands, which get an alcohol-based sanitizer. Okay, so what are the best products? Uh, she said, if you're using the same product for years and have no issues, you don't need to change. Aim for a product with a pH between 5.3 and 7. Avoid products with natural and synthetic fragrance. Avoid methyl isothiazolone. Oh, this is a mouthful. Methyl isothiazolinone and methyl chloroisothiazolinone. Uh, avoid term, the terms mild baby pH balantist, der dermatologist tested and gynecologist tested mean nothing medically. They are marketing terms. If it irritates, don't use it. They say use an unscented product. 
So anyway, if you want to know more about cleansers and soaps, there you go. The soap that we generally suggest to patients is going to be an uh, unscented dove bar. That seems to be the, the best. Or you can use seventh, uh, seventh generation, uh, uh, no, Lovina feminine uh, wash would be one. But you got to be really careful. No douches, nothing scented, anything at all like that. The other book that she has that she wrote a couple of years later, this came out last year, it's a menopause manifesto. And again, it's absolutely fabulous. Like if I ever just need to do it, if I, I got space on the website or a blog, I need to do a blog on something, literally Jill, just pick up the freaking book and read a chapter and I'll be able to get five blogs out of just one chapter in these books. They are so good. The Vagina Bible, The Menopause Manifesto by Dr. Jennifer Gunter, G-U-N-T-E-R. You will love these books, I promise you. I promise you. So good. And I'm going to make the same thing for the IC, IC 101. You know, our new book. IC 101, it's not just a bladder disease. Listen, if you buy that book from us... And you don't like this book, you don't like that book, I will buy it back from you because I have low income patients that I give our the book, things that are returned, you know, things like books that are returned. I you send me that book back, I will give you a refund for that book because I will have other patients that I can give it to. I, I haven't had anybody return it. Um, you know, so but it's all about helping each other. And if it didn't help you. That's fine. Send it back. I'll give you a refund. Oh, it's raining. Oh, now it's a heavy rain. So exciting. All right, my friends. How can I get the gummies? Uh, the name of the company is Yum Earth. Y-U-M Earth. E-A-R-T-H. Yum Earth. Like you probably find them on Amazon. I mean, the candy corn, here, let me open one. Like, they come in really small packets, so this is all I ate. There's like 10, maybe, I don't even know if there's 10 here. Here, hold on. Let me, uh, I'll open one of each and give you kind of a clue. All right. So here is the candy corn. Kind of vanilla-y. Thick and chewy. And there's like a little hint of citrus. This is not the nasty preservative free candy corn. It's definitely better. It's okay. There's like 10 in here. Okay, let's open this one. I haven't tried this one yet. These are the gummy fruits. Yeah, I'm not supposed to use my teeth to open anything. I'm supposed to save my my new my new veneers on my front teeth because I broke them last a year ago. Okay, hold on. I gotta get some scissors. Alrighty, let's let's try the gummy. I gave uh, gummy tarantulas to my nieces and nephews. I've made a big Halloween boxes for them last week. About $100 in each box because I love Halloween and I don't have children, so I want them to enjoy it. Okay, so here we have a gummy. Oh, it's very chewy and hard. My TMJ doctor would not like me doing this. Ugh. 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 Okay. 
I don't recommend the gummies. Ugh. Ugh. Yuck. Okay, that was awful. Those are going right in the trash can. All right, my friends. Tell you what, I think we're done. Last call for questions. I'm still here. I can't go anywhere. It's raining. I'm happy to take any other questions, but if I don't, if we don't get any questions in another minute or two, we'll go ahead and shut it down and I will see you again next week. Last call for questions. Last call for questions. You know what? There was, <clears throat> oh my goodness. Oh, that was so acidic. It's got my tonsil. <laughs> my tonsil on my left side has gummy thought on it. Uh, whew, that was pretty awful. Hey, just out of curiosity. Let's do this. I saw a section in here. Where is it? Where were the old wife's tales? Those were pretty cool. What are our old wives' tales for IC? Our, uh, some of our old wives' tales for IC are cranberry juice. Drink cranberry juice. Obviously, that doesn't work. Drink the juice of a lemon. That's an old wives' tale. Uh, that certainly does not work. We do not recommend drinking the juice of a lemon. Another old wives' tale is you'll grow out of it. Yeah, no. Another old wives' tale is just have sex. It'll go away. Yeah, no. Uh... Or just have a baby. It'll go away. If your hormones will normalize. No. Those are old wives' tales. Look at that. There's a whole nother. I could just do a blog on old wives' tales. Anybody else have any other old wives' tales? I think the worst one is just have sex. Spread them. Spread them. That'll make you better. Of course, said by a doctor, a, a male doctor. Nope. And I think that was Vicki Ratner, the founder of the ICA, that actually that happened to. Just have sex. Just have babies. So it'll go away. Yeah. How can you tell me you're a misogynist without telling me you're a misogynist? Yeah. Tell a woman. Tell a woman to have sex when she has pain. I just need to read these books again. So good. And now I saw that list I had never seen before. I mean, I just didn't remember. Where is it? Where did it go? It's at the end of the book. Um, no. <coughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Look at that. Bleeding after sex. If you if you have bleeding after sex, it could be a cervical polyp, infection, cancer, or an inflammation of the cervix. Irregular periods could be menopause, transition, hormonal contraceptive, hormone therapy, thyroid disease, elevated prolactin. Wow, look at that. Uh, common vaginal moisturizers by pH. Um Oh, that's so interesting. Pharmaceutical grade vaginal hormones, estradiol cream. A dose of, okay, dose equivalents of estrogen. That's so cool. God, this is such a good book. Like, oh my God. All right. Well, anyway, Dina, you've just inspired me to do that. Jeannie says, What is pudendal neuralgia? Pudendal neuralgia means that the nerve, the pudendal nerve, which is coming out. It comes out in four pieces on each side. So there are eight different strings of pudendal nerves total that come out of here. That these nerves at some place are being compressed by muscle. They're being hurt by muscle. Uh, you could have, so if you have pain when you sit down, 
that is relieved by standing up, that's a muscle squeezing the nerve when you're sitting that is released when you're standing. So the pudendal nerve can be compromised in lots of different places in the pelvic, in the pelvic cavity. And it's very, very hard for doctors in some cases to really figure out where it's being compromised. I was working with a patient last week who they were really struggling. They knew she had a nerve entrapment. They knew she had pudendal neuralgia. She had persistent genital arousal disorder. She had pins and needles. So they were trying to do nerve blocks to figure out exactly where it was compromised so that they could figure out what was happening in that location that was pressing on that nerve and, you know, trying to trying to fix whatever they could fix. Ann says, didn't hear what you said about estrogen creams because I got in late. Is there something natural that you can take? No, there's not. No, est estrogen cream is, topical estrogen cream is considered remarkably safe uh, for, um, for use for estrogen atrophy. Uh, it is not associated with a risk of cancer to any great degree because it stays in the skin. It doesn't penetrate into the bloodstream to be distributed throughout the body to any great degree. And again, there's a wonderful OBGYN on Twitter. Her name is Rachel Rubin, Rachel Rubin. I follow her and she's wonderful. Uh, I would really encourage you to follow her on Twitter. I think, you know, that's the thing is Facebook. I mean, listen, I know some people love Facebook. Um, medical professionals really do not gather on Facebook anymore. You're going to find them in big groups on Twitter. And that's where I spend my social networking time now is on Twitter. Because I follow all these doctor groups and it's just so... It's so interesting to, number one, be able to interact with them and support them and get the latest research. Uh, I get way more from Twitter now than I ever got from Facebook. Um, and I really don't see people using LinkedIn at all. And uh, TikTok is for entertainment. You're not going to get much on TikTok. But Facebook, you know, Facebook is on its dying breath, in my opinion. Instagram, same thing. It's just not going to provide a lot of meaningful, meaningful support. It's just not, it can't do it. It's not the right environment for support. It's too hostile and aggressive. You know, we do have a support forum on our website, the original IC support forum. And uh, it's still open. Um, uh, I mean, there are 50,000, oh, well over 50,000 members. Uh, it, it's not used very much these days and I may end up shutting it down. I don't know. I mean, I understand people are going all over the place right now on the internet and that's fine. There's a lot of good wisdom to be shared. I mean, that forum has 20 years of patient stories in it and data in it. And if you ever have a question about something that's going like, you know, like we were talking about high blood pressure medications and IC, that's a place you go. You go over there and search in the IC network forum. Because that you've got one-to-one -one patients talking with each other. Uh, Rhonda, the book was called The Vagina Bible um, by Dr. Jen Gunter, The Vagina Bible. Oh, wait, that's the wrong one. Hold on. Right here. You got to love the cover, a zipper, pink zipper. <laughs> so The Vagina Bible. And then her newer book is called The Menopause Manifesto. And it's just, she's a good writer. It's funny. I mean, there's a lot of funny stuff in here, but she's very research-based also, but it's, 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 she's very blunt. If you follow Dr. Jen Gunter on TikTok, I mean, I'm sorry, on Twitter, and she has, she does uh, health editorials for the New York Times. She's got a TED, TED Talks podcast, a fabulous podcast talking about all sorts of interesting issues. Um, she's extremely funny and extremely entertaining, but she's also not afraid to, uh, drop the F bomb with somebody who's dropping the F bomb at her. She's, uh, I, I, I role model her. I find, I consider her a role model, but I, it would scare me to be as aggressive as she is. She takes a lot of, of crap from people. Um, and, um, I don't know how she does it. I mean, I think about the, 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 what I get from people and, and it's, 
you know, it's part of the job to be criticized. It's part of the job to have people curse you out and stuff like that, especially people who don't agree and to be personally insulting and demeaning and whatever, whatever gets their, whatever gets their, you know, rocks off or whatever. And I always think that any, that a lot of it says more about them than it does about me, especially personal attacks, right? Especially personal attack. Like, it, like seriously, if there's something that I'm doing or I have done or I have said that you disagree with, pop me an email, give me a phone call and say, you know what, Jill, I, I you know, I respect what you're trying to do, um, but you did make a little mistake. And I just wanted to walk you through that so that you can correct that in the future. Because I'm not perfect. I'm going to make mistakes too. You, I dare, I double dog dare anybody to sit in my chair for three hours and get everything perfect. I'm not going to get everything perfect. I want to try to come in to this with a really good sense of humility. I try at least. Tips for placement of a tens unit pad. I have a fat belly, so <laughs> Mandy. Uh, yeah, you know. Uh, here, hold on. The book that would be the most helpful for you is this book. Ending Female Pelvic Pain by Issa Herrera. Now, we have not, we have sold this for a couple of years. I think it's been out for five, six years. We have not been able to reorder it. So I don't know if it's out of print or not, but she has a whole section in here on where to place tens unit uh pads so um and then she explains exactly why so for example uh you can do them along the spine to the side to reduce low back pain hip pain and, and general pain right um the lower back right on each side there now, you guys, for TENS unit, understand that TENS unit should never hurt. And more is not better. If you're using a TENS unit and you put it on your body and you turn it all the way up until it's hurting and stinging you, you are damaging nerves. Tens, uh, the, what TENS units do is they just kind of re-regulate nerves. They shouldn't hurt. If they hurt, it's on too high. All right. So here's another example. Uh, two pads higher up on the lower back. And then one on each butt cheek. Uh, you can two pads on the lower back and then two at the bottom of the butt cheek. I don't want to share that picture because that's full body nudity. Um, and for the bladder along the belly, right, along the bikini line. So let's just read that section for a moment. Uh, it helps reduce pain with sitting, pain with positional changes, bladder pain, and generalized pelvic pain. Place pads in a semicircle near and around the pubic and hip bones. Then she goes into biofeedback, strain, counter strain. And one of the best positions you can do is happy baby, right? Happy baby. If you're, if you are struggling with a tremendous pelvic floor tension and you're out doing your thing that needs to be done, you're out shopping or at the bank, one of the best things you can do is just, let's say you're at line at the bank, drop your keys and then don't bend over and pick it up. Squat down, squat down, put your butt on your ankles and that immediately releases your pelvic floor. And that is a perfect thing. Rhonda says, thank you. The Vagina Bible and that purple lavender book you were reading. She sounds like my girl. They say it's healthy. To, yeah, it is. It is absolutely healthy to drop the F-bomb. Absolutely. Especially for pain processing. I actually have a book that proves that. That if you're in pain, it's okay. It's One of the first things you can do is go, ouch. Or if you don't say, ouch, you can go, F. And that actually begins a whole pain processing adaptation in the brain. Uh, it's a stray. It's Facebook changes spelling. Yeah. Another book that is really good. 
is this book. It's a little bitty book, When It Hurts Down There by Dr. Angie Storr. This is fabulous. Uh, we have this in our shop. And um, uh, so 15 Proven Techniques to Alleviate Pelvic Pain. And what's very cool about this book is that she really, she helps you understand that you can interrupt pain processing several different ways. Your pain, let's say you, you uh, step on a nail, the pain message shoots up your leg, goes to your spine, goes up your spine to your lower, the lower portion of your brain. The lower portion of your brain do, it, call, it does the gate. It only lets the most important pain messages through. It, once it gets through the lower portion of your brain, it goes to your midbrain and the midbrain establishes context. You know, the purpose of the midbrain is try to figure out, is this good pain or bad pain? And if it gets through the midbrain, then it will go to the upper brain. And that's what tells you to remove your hand, jump, whatever, to remove your body. But you can interrupt pain messages at all three levels. So one of the ways that you can, if you start, let's just say you're driving in a car and your bladder's starting starting to hurt at you, and you know you've got another half hour drive, slap your thigh. Just slap your thigh. Just like I'm doing right here. Slap your thigh. Not, not, not hard. You know, just keep slapping it. And, and because that's another source of stimulation, your lower brain is trying to figure out, is, should it pay attention to your bladder or should it change, pay attention to your thigh? And that, so that's the first thing you can do is you can distract your brain, distract your brain by giving it something else to pay attention to. And this is what lepers used to do when, before they understood that leprosy was a bacterial disease that they could treat with antibiotics, people with leprosy, they, they lost fingers and feet and it was terrible. And what they found, um, in a book called Pain, the Gift That Nobody Wants that I read years ago, is the doctor went to a couple of leper clinics and there were always people outside slapping themselves with metal brushes. It's like, why? Well, because it creates distraction. So that's the first thing you can do when you're in pain and you can't easily get home is just create a distraction. Then the second thing you can do is at the midbrain, you have to establish context. Is it good pain or bad pain? So the midbrain, let's see. Uh, let's see. So here's the gateway, the gateways. The midbrain, the area of the midbrain that links pain to emotion is called the limbic system or the next step in the pain process. These places also link emotions with memories. So it's important. It's an important system to your brain. It is responsible for the warm feeling of satisfaction after sex. It's a place that makes you jump during a scary movie. It makes you feel happy when you smell pie baking because it reminds you of your grandma. But one important thing to remember is that the brain needs to be busy doing something positive. If you busy doing it, if you busy it doing something negative, like being afraid or feeling lonely, you'll actually speed up pain signals. We don't need any of that. Some of the interesting things that go on in the midbrain are conditioned responses, such as learned fear, the fight or flight reflex, pain-related depression, sexual satisfaction, aggression, daydreaming, emotions, addiction, compulsion, and self-awareness. Let's see. Um, and then it just goes, goes through some of those. Um, so how do you alleviate pain by targeting brain processing? Number one, use foul language when the pain is really intense. If you've ever hit your thumb with a hammer or stubbed your toe on a table, you've probably sworn or at least wanted to. This kind of reactive vocalization starts in the lower brain gateways. It's a spontaneous reaction to pain and it actually reduces the pain signal. Now, I'm not suggesting picking up a general expletive habit. This only works well when you're not accustomed to using foul language re regularly. And if it's against your morals to use foul language, and she writes, my parents are cringing right now, then you can skip this technique altogether. And then tech, uh, technique number two is kind of calming your, 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 your nervous system. Technique number three, deep breathing. You can certainly do that in the car. Uh, technique number four, the inner way to interfere with pain in, in the emotional processing area is to have more happy emotions and less unhappy ones. 
Pain is processed faster when it's linked to an unhappy emotion like fear, guilt, anger, disgust, hatred, or rejection. The brain assumes if you are unhappy, the pain signals must be more important. Pain is processed slower when it's linked to positive emotions like happiness, love, calm, calmness, interest, enthusiasm. So this is where doing affirmations are important. You know, things that are, you know, or doing I spy, you know, doing our wonderful I spy technique. If you could look at anything that would put a smile on your face, what would that be? Take a nice, slow, deep breath. If you could smell something that would put a smile on your face, what would that be? Hot apple pie, hot cinnamon rolls, it's a deep breath. If you could taste something that would put a smile on your face, what would that be? Ooh, again, hot cinnamon roll for me. If you could touch something that would put a smile on your face, what would that be? Oh, petting a cat or a dog. If you could, you know, and so again, when you do that exercise, you are forcing, you're, you're slowing pain processing. Um, it's important to keep your brain busy. If you look at how a brain works, it's kind of like flying through a thunderstorm. If you ever flown through a thunder, thunderstorm or above a thunderstorm, you see lightning here and here and here and here. Different parts of the brain light up, right? It's beautiful flying over a thunderstorm. Absolutely beautiful. Um, so your brain, that's what your brain looks like. That's how your brain processes. This area lights up, this area lights up, this area lights up, this area lights up. And so in, in pain, if you're in pain, it goes quicker and more par different parts of the brain light up. And so one of the ways that you can control pain at that level is to keep your brain busy by doing other things. So as an example, I had to have an MRI uh, for my ruptured disc in my back last December. And, you know, and it was a narrow machine. So like it was right here, right? And you're in the tunnel and it's very loud and you're like going, oh, my God, get me out of here. Right. OK, well, I didn't do that. So the first thing I did when I had the MRI was I did um, uh, I did I spy. Then I did my chakra meditation, which I used to do when I was training as a triathlon where I would uh, visualize my chakra spinning. And I've never talked about that before. Anyway, that was me. That's what I did. Um, and then I did kind of, uh, something like deep breathing and I kind of ran out of my techniques. Right. And I was only halfway through and I could feel my tension level going up and I actually said, are we done? Are we getting close to being done? And of course they didn't respond to me. So what I ended up doing is I ended up counting by sevens, seven, 14, 21, 28, you know, and I got all the way up to like 600. Um, and what was so interesting was when I was counting, I had no anxiety and no stress and no panic. But when I stopped, I could feel it come up. So what was I doing? I was using different parts of my brain and I was making them unavailable. I was keeping them so busy. I was making them unavailable for that panic response. So... Uh, very, very interesting. Mandy says, I had luck with Valium and Baclofen from a compounding pharmacy, but it was $100. Can you price other coupons and can they mail it? Mm, I don't know, honey. Uh, I don't have any. I've never had any coupons for vaginal Valium or anything like that. It's okay. I'm happy to take questions. Rhonda said, very interesting. This author of the book sounds like she uses psychology. That was my dream to be a psychologist. Never happened because of suffering from IC. I know, honey, I couldn't finish my PhD. So, I mean, I got my master's, but I didn't get my PhD. I wanted to do the same thing. Uh, I just couldn't sit in a car for five years. So when it hurts down there, right? I'd still love to get my PhD, but I can't justify paying $100,000 for it because that's my retirement. And I, I can't, I can't justify it anymore. I can't, can't do it. I'd love to do it, but the only way I can do it is I win the lotto. So anyway, all right, my friends. Well, listen, big giant hugs to you all. You've got this. Never doubt that you've never been more prepared to deal with whatever happens to you than you are at this very moment, because you are truly one day older and one day wiser. 
do not worry about repeating the mistakes from the past because you've already learned from those. You're not going to repeat those mistakes from the past. I need you to focus not on the past, but focus on today. Focus on tomorrow. What can you do today to give yourself some, some comfort? What can you do tomorrow that will be an investment in your long-term health? And so you know my routine. For 15 minutes a day, I need you to do something for your spirit and your soul, something that gives you comfort, whether it is sitting outside in the rain, which I'm rather tempted to do, or um, reading whatever book you'd like to read or listening to a service, whatever service you'd like to read. Just for 15 minutes a day, do something that will nurture your soul and your spirit. Listening to John Denver, that sounds good. For 15 minutes a day, I need you to get down on the ground and do your pelvic floor work or make an icy friendly meal that's not acidic. For 15 minutes a day, I need you to do something to improve your knowledge level. I know some of you are pretty amazed at what I can, can what I talk about, you know, but why? Because I read constantly. I want to learn. I want to learn. God didn't give us the skills to deal with this when we were born. We got to learn them. We got to learn them. And what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to sit in your room with the windows shut, the drapes shut, the door shut, and you suffering in silence. Come on. You deserve better than that. Get yourself out of bed if you can. Open your drapes and try to walk a little bit. If you can walk out your front door to your, to the front, to your street, that would be great. Because when you move, your body starts producing natural painkillers. And listen, anxiety disorder is real. I know this. I had anxiety disorder. You notice I said had. Why do I say had? Because I took, I had terrible anxiety as a teenager and in my 20s and into my early 30s. I used to have panic attacks going to the doctor because I felt that they were going to hurt me because they did hurt me. Some of those tests were very painful back then. And just one day, it was just like, I just went, I can't do this. I do not want to have a panic attack every time I go to the doctor. I remember, I, it was exactly where I was. I was pacing in my backyard, exactly where I was. I just said, I can't do this anymore. I need help. Because God didn't give me the skills to deal with IC when I was born. I have to go learn them. I had to learn them. You're here learning skills. I had to go learn skills too. So I signed up for an anxiety management class at my local hospital. And it absolutely changed my life. And since I've taken that class, I have not had a panic attack. I, I, I didn't have a panic attack in the MRI room either when I had the MRI, right? I haven't had one. Why? Why? When you have anxiety disorder, you catastrophize every day. You don't just catastrophize every day. You catastrophize every hour. No, you don't catastrophize every hour. You catastrophize every five minutes. Like every other minute, when you pay attention to your thoughts, they're pretty damn negative thoughts. Hey, Jill, you want to go to a movie? No, COVID. No way. Hey, you want to go take a drive? No, it's going to flare. I'm going to flare. It's going to be too bumpy. Hey, Jill, you want to go to trivia night? No, I don't. Okay, that's somebody. That's somebody with anxiety disorder. Hey, would you like to go fly to Ireland in two years? Oh, hell no. No, it'll hurt my IC. Come on, it's freaking two years from now. How the hell do you know what's going to happen? You could be cured in six months for all we know, right? So when you've got an anxiety disorder, you catastrophize and you ruminate. You can't stop thinking about something. You know what I mean? It's like, will the doctor believe me? No, he'll never believe me. Why doesn't the doctor believe me? Oh my God, I hate this doctor. No, he doesn't believe me. No, but you know, you just think about the same thing over and over and over again for hours. So here's the problem. When you catastrophize like that, you scare your brain. You scare your brain. It's scary. It triggers the fight or flight response. Hey, Jill, you want to go out to dinner right now? No. Hell no. Okay. But in your brain, you've just, you've just triggered fight or flight. You have triggered a jolt of adrenaline. And it's the adrenaline that raises your heart rate, raises your blood pressure, and tightens your muscles. So you just did it. And two minutes from now, you did it again. And five minutes from now, holy, holy hell, you did it again. 
Well, by the end of the day, you you are in adrenaline overload. You have got tons of adrenaline floating through your body, raising your heart rate, raising your blood pressure, driving these negative thoughts. And you know what it's like when you have a panic attack? You run. Oh my God, I can't get on that plane. That happened to me once at an airport. I had a panic attack at the airport. Couldn't get on the freaking plane. Couldn't even check in. So the anxiety management class that I took said, listen, we consider anxiety disorder chemical sensitivity and that your body right now is flooded with so much adrenaline that it can't find a normal. So that's our goal. Our goal in this class is to break you out of adrenaline overdose because you're overdosing on adrenaline. So this is how we're going to do this. And it works. And I still do it today. So they said, we have one goal. In the next week, we're going to break you out of adrenaline overload. And this is how you're going to do it. You're going to have to pay attention to your thoughts. Every single time you have a negative thought, the first thing we need you to do is visualize a stop sign. Just stop. Stop for a moment. You're stopping your brain. Stop. Then you're going to take a nice, slow, deep breath in and out. Okay. That oxygen from that deep breath has now rendered that adrenaline shot neutral. It's done. It's over. Oxygen turns off adrenaline. So we have just negated the adrenaline from that negative thought. So stop sign, deep breath. And the third step is you have to have something that you say to yourself to remind you it's a thought and it has no power. It's just a freaking thought. So what do I say to myself is, oh, my God, Jill, how arrogant can you possibly be to think that you can predict the future? For all you know, tomorrow is going to be a blessed, wonderful day in your life. Get a grip. It's a thought. It has no power. Okay. So they taught us the step. Stop sign. Deep breath. Minimize the thought. All we're trying to do is get you out of adrenaline overload because you are chemically sensitive to adrenaline. So they said, they sent us on our way and said, just for a week, just do this. We promise you, just do this. I was stunned. And when I walked out of that classroom at my local Kaiser Permanente and I paid attention to what I was thinking, oh my God, I had, I was mean. I was mean to myself. It's like, oh, Jill, you'll you'll never find a husband. You'll never have children. You'll never succeed. You're a waste. You know, all the negative self-talk that happens when you have anxiety disorder. And then God forbid you're driving. Oh, my God, that car might hit me, right? Whatever. Whatever. So I, I'm a chemist. I was, I was interested in the chemistry. So I did it. And the first day, I did it easily 100 times. I was shocked. I was stunned at how mean I was to myself. I was stunned. I was so freaking tired of feeling like the disappointment in my family, right? That's how I felt. Okay, so easily, 100 times. The next day, 50 times. The day after that, maybe 20 times. By Friday, I did it once. And for the first time in 20 years, I was calm. For the first time in 20 years, wow, wow. God, I feel good. My heart wasn't racing. I felt good. And I knew what to do. As soon as I had, oh, hey, Jill, it won't last. Oh, help, whoa, whoa, stop sign. Deep breath. Oh, my God, Jill, how arrogant can you be or not God? This might be the best day of your life. Okay, but that deep breath turned off the adrenaline from that negative thought, right? I have been doing that for 35 years. That was created by a surgeon with anxiety disorder for his son who also had anxiety disorder. 
And it was magic. Because what I, you know, I was like baffled. It's like, for those of you who know me and follow me, listen, I'm a positive person. Fundamentally, I am I am a happy, joyful person living, working in a very happy room. I surround myself with happiness. And I just didn't understand, like, why the hell are my thoughts so negative? I didn't understand it. And I've asked so many doctors about this over the years. It's like, why do we turn to the negative? And the answer was really kind of a chemistry issue that it, from a brain chemistry standpoint, it was just easier. It's part of that fight or flight response. Think about how you're built, you know, your brain, your brain's job is just to, you know, monitor how you're doing and save your life. And so it's much easier for the brain to trigger that fight or flight response than it is to trigger a happy response. Apparently, that's what I was told. And what I found is that, you know, I got to the point where literally I ended up doing it maybe once a month until COVID hit, you know, until COVID hit. And I mean, I didn't even have a panic attack during uterine cancer and all that sort of stuff. I didn't. I was doing that in the car, driving to the hospital and afterwards. So I'm telling you, in a crisis, it works like a charm. Um, and that's what I do if I'm dealing with something scary with my parents, you know, that's what I do. Um, okay. I forgot what I was going to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going to make a point. Okay. I totally lost my point. It'll come to me in five minutes or three minutes or two minutes. Well, anyway, just understand that the longer you stay in anxiety, the more uncomfortable and unhappy you'll be and the more intense your pain will be. And you and I have to take responsibility for working on those skills. You weren't born with the skills to deal with life during COVID. You weren't born to ski still, you know, with the skills to handle pain every day. You have to learn them. You have to be humble enough to learn them. And if you stay at home and hide and think you're going to do it on your own, you might do it on your own, but it might take years. Wouldn't it be great to learn from somebody who's already gone through this? Wouldn't it be great? You can talk to people on the phone now. You can talk to anxiety specialists on the phone. It's about skill building. It's just about learning skills. Uh, wanting an angel says one thing is that when someone talks about anxiety, the doctors can, can ignore your physical problems. Also, not everyone with, with anxiety has IC their levels of anxiety. Exactly. Patients with IC who have anxiety generally are the patients who have chronic overlapping pain conditions. IC subtype five, also known as central sensitization. That's the group that's going to have anxiety disorder. Uh, Mandy says, are, um, are we on YouTube? Yeah, we're broadcasting live right now on YouTube. We simulcast live on Facebook and YouTube. My channel on YouTube is I see and Jill. I see and Jill. So anyway, it's okay if you don't know how to do it. It's good to ask questions. It's good to break out of your comfort zone. And if you don't know something, let's do some research and try to figure it out together. That's what I'm here for. The doctors ignore physical problems to prescribe medicine to kill your emotions. Doctors get thousands of dollars. I'm not going to disagree with you, hon. And that's why, again, I like building those self-help skills. You know, the, you, building those personal skills that you can use on a day-to-day -day basis, minute by minute, hour by hour, to help you learn to manage that stress a little while. Just the power of a deep breath is remarkable. I mean, it has a chemical it has a very strong chemical effect in the brain that's very beneficial because it calms adrenaline, right? So just learning that simple, basic deep breath in for three, out for three. And there are lots of different ways of doing a deep breath. That's just what I do. So, all right, my friends. Well, listen, we have been going for four hours and 20 minutes. And I'm going to need to get up and walk around because my levator muscles are going to be locked down tight. I'm going to walk like a little lady for the next minute. But anyway, I wish you well. Big giant hug to 
everybody out there. If you found this meeting helpful, please come on, come on over to the IC Network and become a member. If you become a member of the IC Network, you get our great magazine called The IC Optimist. There you go. We've been doing that for 19 years now. And uh, uh, you get lots of back issues and stuff like that. So think about that. Or you can make a donation or you can you can do anything. You can shop in our store. I don't require that. I'm here because I'm just like you. I'm an IC patient. We just want to help. Rhonda says, oh, honey, thank you so much. Oh, you're very sweet. Thank you for those very, very kind words. Mining and Angel said, this is not adrenaline. Sadly, medicine must be practiced uh, differently. There needs to be laws stopping doctors from getting money. I, honey, I agree with you. I, I Pharmacology, like, hey, man, I got a degree in pharmacology. Uh, drug development. And uh, uh, what I was told on by my uh, uh, lab director uh, was never, ever go to work for a pharmaceutical company because you would be asked to lie. There you go. So if you want to talk about that a little bit more, wanting an angel, wanting, wanting one angel, if you want to try to write an article on that, I'd be happy to do that. I think that that's very, very important. So, all right, my friends, I will see you all later. Have a great week. Believe in yourself. You have a purpose. You have a purpose. We're going to help you get there. Honey, so wanting an angel. Now, listen, girl. Now, now hold on a sec. We got to talk for just a moment. So understand, so she says, uh, and Jill, I mean no disrespect, but medicine must be practiced differently. I agree. And there needs to be a cure for IC. And when there is a cure, a lot of the anxiety will go away. Okay, so let's just talk about this for a moment. Cure implies a disease process, right? We need a cure for cancer. But here's the reality. The IC patient community is extremely diverse and not everybody has a disease process, right? So we have subtypes now. We've got bladder centric and beyond bladder. Those are the, those are the key main groups. But in the bladder centric group, we've got Hunter's lesions, but then we also have IC subtype two bladder while driven, which can be estrogen atrophy or be, can be chemical irritation. So with the estrogen atrophy, we don't cure the estrogen atrophy. We want to uh, try to help the bladder be stronger and better. So cure doesn't apply to estrogen atrophy. Cure also doesn't necessarily apply to chemocystitis. Okay. But cure could apply to chronic infection. That's true. But let's go to our biggest subtype, IC subtype 3, pelvic floor driven. Pelvic floor driven is injury. We don't cure an injury. We heal an injury. And that's one of the things that patients really struggle with is that why do I flare? Why do I have a flare whenever I have sex? That's a pelvic floor muscle flare. Why do I flare when I get in the car? That's your muscles. And so injuries happen and injuries heal. The, the patient group that has the best round of success are the pelvic floor patients because they respond so beautifully to pelvic floor physical therapy if that is their underlying issue. Let's think about IC subtype four, pudendal neuralgia. That's a nerve that's being compromised by a muscle. And again, that's injury. So we're not gonna cure an injury, we're gonna heal that injury. And we know how to do that by relaxing the muscle and by calming the nerve down. I see subtype five though is a really interesting one because that's chronic overlapping pain conditions. So these are the patients who have an extremely sensitive central nervous system. So we have very, very sensitive skin. We are drug sensitive. We are food sensitive. We have an incredible sense of smell. We smell things that other people cannot smell. Smells drive us crazy. We taste things that people cannot smell, taste because our central nervous system is different. We might even have visual sensitivity, but there's a funky pattern in a carpet or a wallpaper. We have to close our eyes and turn away because it's too much stimulation coming in. So with central sensitization, chronic overlapping pain conditions, that's the central nervous system, but it's not a disease. It is 
what they call a central nervous system maladaption. It means that the central nervous system has been um, normalized to fight or flight. That patient's brain, specifically the amygdala in their brain, is on. It's on. It's not turning off. It is staying turned on. Normally, if you opened your door and you saw a saber-toothed tiger across the street, your sympathetic nervous system would take over. And its whole, its entire job is to save your life. It's going to, uh, the amygdala gets turned on, adrenaline shoots out, it raises your heart rate, it raises your blood pressure, it tightens your muscles, and it prepares you to, run, it prepares you to fight, fight for your life or run. Absolutely. But normally, once the saber-toothed tiger walks away, it turns off. It turns off. And the parasympathetic nervous system takes over and calms everything down. So that's not a disease to cure. That is, in fact, a central nervous system that is kind of stuck. So I attended a conference last year called the International Pelvic Pain Society. It was their annual meeting that went into the brain science and all the brain scans. Everything was so good. Okay, but but honey, you're not understanding. This is what I'm trying to explain right now. The, the, you, this is what, this is exactly what I'm trying to strain. See, I had that exact same reaction 20 years ago. So this is what you have to understand is that when you are in fight or flight, well, let, let me take it a step back. So at the conference, um, the most important class was a pediatric risk factor class. Why do some children develop multiple pain conditions over their lives? and others don't. Why does that happen? And what the research shows is that for 80% of those children, myself included, there was a major physical trauma that they were hit by a car, they broke a leg, they broke their tail, something big happened. And here's the thing we all know is that adults don't pay attention to children and children in pain are often not believed. So imagine being a young child in pain and they're not getting treated. That would certainly, certainly get the brain heavily involved in fight or flight or panic, right? For the other 20%, there was a history of abuse or bullying. So I want to give you the example of bullying for a moment. Think about this for a moment. Imagine you have a bully at school, a really bad bully, somebody who humiliates you in front of the other kids or hits you or hurts you. So for that young child, as soon as they leave to go to school, they go into fight or flight. Their heart rate is up, their blood pressure up, their pelvic floor muscles are tight. They're preparing them to, to fight, okay? And then as they go to school and as they're at school, they are hyper vigilant, man. They are looking ever. Oh my God, where is he? Is he there? Is it? Oh my God, there's his friend. Oh my God, where is he? Right? Massive hyper, massive, massive, massive hyper vigilance. That child's brain is thinks that a saber tooth tiger is after them, and the only break that that child gets is when they get home. It's when they get home for three or four hours. They have, they're safe. They're home, so things calm down. The muscles relax, the heart rate reduces, and the blood pressure reduces. Now, here's what we know. 20 days of bullying changes brain chemistry for the worst, by far. It damages the brain. 20 days of mind-body medicine reverses that damage. It reverses that damage. Okay. Okay. So let's think now about long-term chronic muscle tension. This is, this is the point you've really got to understand. Your pelvic floor muscles are locked down tight for days. And for some kids, for weeks or months or years. Think about all those women with vaginismus. They got muscles so tight they can't have sex. The consequence of tight muscles on the bladder are devastating because tight muscles cause ischemia blood deprivation. Those tight muscles squeeze the blood vessels that provide blood flow throughout the body. 
uh, and throughout the pelvis to the bladder, to the vagina, to the uterus, to the rectum, if that blood supply is minimized, it's impossible for the bladder to be healthy. That bladder wall is going to start breaking down. That is called the viscerosomatic effect. The viscerosomatic effect. Can muscles change organ behavior? Absolutely. If those muscles are so tight that they're restricting blood flow and they're damaging blood vessels and they're damaging nerves, the bladder is going to be damaged in the long run. And so, so when we look at the connection between IC, IBS, vulvodynia, TMJ, migraines, all of those chronic overlapping pain conditions, this is what we know. We have a brain that's in fight or flight. We have muscles in chronic tension that is not releasing. That patient is stuck in chronic tension. That patient is stuck in fight or flight. And now we have ischemia, oxygen deprivation, nutrition deprivation of the bladder. There are two reflexes in the pelvis, the somatovisceral reflex, and that is can blood can organs change muscle behavior? And the answer is yes. If you're in pain, your muscles are going to get tight. But we have the opposite. Can muscles change organ behavior? And the answer is yes. If those muscles are so tight that they're restricting blood flow to the bladder, the bladder wall is going to not be healthy. That's what you're missing. That's what you're missing. That's the big deep connection. You know, this is a very, this, there's not a cognitive process happening here. When your brain is in fight or flight, all it's doing is it's paying attention to your senses and it's trying to save your life. Okay, so your question is, and then what foods would heal the bladder? No foods would heal the bladder. What would heal everything is proper blood supply proper blood supply. We need to get that patient out of fight or flight so that their muscles are, aren't tight. And the way we do that is with mind-body medicine and with physical therapy, especially if their muscles are locked down. That patient can be in bl on bladder therapies for their whole life and they'll never get better. They'll never get better because it's not addressing the underlying core dysfunction. And the underlying core dysfunction is muscle tension, oxygen deprivation, and nutrition deprivation. So the patient that what they need is they need physical therapy, they need and they need to learn how to manage their anxiety so they don't start locking down their muscles again. Does that make sense? Kind of sort of. So for some people, so again, let's look at these subtypes for a moment. I see subtype one, hunter's lesions. Worst form of I see. What causes a hunter's lesion? We now know what can cause a hunter's lesion, a viral infection like COVID. Okay, so that's a very distinct patient group. I see subtype two, bladder wall driven. These are the patients whose symptoms start after chemotherapy, where the chemicals of the chemo irritate their bladder. Okay, or uh, they're drinking way too much diet soda, right? That's irritating their bladder, or they have estrogen atrophy. Okay, I see subtype three, pelvic floor driven. I see subtype four, pudendal neuralgia. I see subtype five is the chronic overlapping pain condition, central sensitization. Okay, so if you have 102 fever, you have a bladder infection, which excludes you from a diagnosis of IC. And, that, and your positive ANA, that again, that's something different. And they have to figure that out. But it's all about your subtype, hun. It's all about your subtype. If your IC began after you were raped, if your IC began after you had a baby, if your IC began after you fell and broke your tailbone, that is a musculoskeletal problem. That is a musculoskeletal problem. And the, the bladder is a secondary victim of an underlying muscle issue. If your IC began after chemotherapy, we know what that is. That is a chemical injury to the bladder wall. If your IC began... You know, uh, if you don't know what began your IC, I mean, ultimately that's a challenge. IC is a grab bag diagnosis. It doesn't mean anything. They put everybody in the diagnosis of IC when they don't know what's wrong with you. But here's what we do know. Bladder therapies don't work for the vast majority of patients out there. Why? Because a lot of us don't have bladder wall issues. My bladder is perfectly healthy and normal. 
And I had pain so severe from my bladder that I could barely walk. But underneath it all, my subtype is pelvic floor. It was my muscles. It was my muscles. And I also have a history of bullying. So your IC began in childhood, possibly after an infection when you were two years old. However, you were diagnosed. So my, so my IC began in seventh grade. It began in seventh grade when I had frequency urgency and I had urethral dilations for years. So Rhonda says here uh, that she has a positive ANA and she has lupus that I would find out why the ANA is positive. Yeah, the ANA is not associated with, with IC, although it could kind of put you in this little group of patients who have lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, and IC. And that's a little itty bitty subtype. But the point is that we're not all the same. There's tremendous diversity in this patient population. So there will never be a cure for everybody. There will never be a cure for everybody. There could be a cure for Hunter's lesions, because if they can cure the viral infection that's causing that, that would be a cure. There is, and with pelvic floor driven, if their symptoms began after falling on their butt, then we know how to fix that with pelvic floor physical therapy. You know, so everybody's different. There's, you know, we are all uniquely different. And I know you want, and I believe me, I want there to be a cure. The challenge here is that interstitial cystitis is, is a grab bag diagnosis. It doesn't mean anything. It just means you have frequency, urgency, and pain, but they don't know why. That's why we're going much deeper now. And this has been happening for like a decade now. It's been, researchers across the world now, everybody's trying to define these subtypes because we want you to find the right therapy for you. We don't want patients to be doing bladder therapies, Elmeron for 20 years to go blind, only to discover after the fact that their fundamental problem was their pelvic floor. So from a naming standpoint, what you're gonna see in the future is you're gonna see maybe the only patients diagnosed with interstitial cystitis will be Hunter's lesion patients. I know, honey, I know you do. Um, the rest of us are going to be in a pain syndrome category, whether they call it bladder pain syndrome or pelvic pain syndrome, who the hell cares? The point is, is that we have pain and we've got to figure out why we have pain. And, and the exciting thing now is that We've stepped away from the, everybody has an incurable bladder disease. We stepped away from that in 2008, because in 2008, we had our first research study that proved that pelvic floor physical therapy outperformed bladder therapies. And it was at that moment, everybody went, uh-oh, maybe this isn't just a bladder, bladder wall problem. Maybe it is a pelvic floor problem for some people. So, honey, I love your question. I'm not angry with you in any way, shape, or form. This is exactly why I'm here, to try to give context. And, and we've come so far. We're doing so much better now at helping patients figure out the underlying cause so that we can get rid of the source of their pain. As an example... Uh, and and I'm I'm going to give you let me I'm going to give you one really uh, I'll give you one really important example Sue who's in our Facebook group and she's come on many many times diagnosed with interstitial cystitis did all the bladder therapies nothing worked and you know a lot of people watching listening to this because about a thousand two thousand people are going to listen to this eventually right whether they stick it out four and a half hours that's another story okay so anyway diagnosed with IC. Never, bladder therapy has never worked for her. Then somebody checked her pelvic floor. They were tight. She went to pelvic floor physical therapy. And what was really interesting is that normally with pelvic floor, you see the muscles respond over time. Like with me, my muscles absolutely responded over time. It took a couple sessions, but things absolutely improved. 
But in her case, what made her case so interesting is that whenever they tried it, it hurt. And it hurt in one location. One location. And she came to one of these meetings and said that. And it's like, you know, this is what I say to patients. If, if your pain is always in one location, we got to look at that spot. What the hell is there? Like I was working with a guy whose pain was over by his right hip bone. He thought it, he thought it was his bladder. No, that's, your, that's something over there. So she was fascinated. She was fascinated by this. And so she went back to the doctor, happened to be one of the best doctors in the country. They did some visualization. And you know what they found? She had a mass, a giant mass of scar tissue woven through her pelvic floor muscles. Doctor, really rare. So aggressive that here, one of the best doctors in the world didn't feel confident treating it. Only one physician in the world they felt could treat it. And she went, oh, I know what that's from. I fell off my horse really badly. Oh, my God, I was hurt so badly by that. So imagine a patient diagnosed with interstitial cystitis, frequency, urgency, pressure, pain, never responds to bladder therapies. And underneath it all, it was never her bladder. Her bladder was a victim of something else that happened. You could have a fibroid tumor pushing on your bladder and that could mimic all the symptoms of IC. And we know from research that when that fibroid tumor is removed, the bladder symptoms usually go away. So we're really now looking at a much bigger, wider environment here. And there's a book that's really good that's free. Hold on, let me, let me show it to you. Facing Pelvic Pain by Dr. Elise Day and uh, what's the other doctor? Dr. Theodore Stern. They're at Harvard. This is the book we needed 30 years ago because it literally goes through every possible condition that can affect the bladder. Like seriously, you don't know what's wrong with you and your bladder's always normal. You go to this book and it, the, every chapter there's what musculoskeletal problems can cause pelvic pain? What neurological problems can cause pelvic pain? What bone and ligament problems can cause pelvic pain? What GI problems can cause pelvic pain? What female problems can, male problems can cause? For anybody, and you just, you just don't get it. Bladder therapies are not working. You're not getting better. This book is free on Kindle Unlimited. And it is mind-blowingly effective because we don't want you to waste 20 years on Elmeron and potentially go blind. You know, we have got to under, you know, it's about cause and effect. The symptoms are the effect. We got to figure out what the hell the cause is. And it's just so exciting now. We've come so far and it's just, and, and, you know, I mean, listen, um, What, what, what I want every patient to do, what I want every patient to find is, number one, relief from their symptoms. Number two, I don't want any, anybody carrying any shame or blame. Seriously, this is not your fault. You haven't done anything freaking wrong. Stop it. Stop beating yourself up about this. I know y'all are. I know many of you are doing that. Stop it. You're hurt. You're hurt. And just like somebody who's hit by a car, you deserve care. You deserve care. And it's hard when you're feeling so bad that you've got to be your own advocate. You want somebody to come in and rescue you. But this is where we got to step up. Wanting an angel said, I think it's my bladder because Christine Whitmore diagnosed me with hydrodistension surgery and biopsy. And again, thank you. So, um, you know, again, I also understand that we have thrown out the finding uh, petechial hemorrhages and glomerulations on the bladder. If you were diagnosed 20 years ago and they saw those red spots in your bladder, we now know the test itself causes that. So that's been thrown out as a diagnostic tool. You know, it has. Um, but anyway, 
carry hope in your heart. And if you ever want to talk, I'd be happy to try to help you with the subtypes and see if we can go a little bit deeper as to where you might be. Because when you were diagnosed, they didn't talk about the subtypes. They didn't know about that subtypes. We're now getting much better at understanding the many different ways that the bladder can be involved from Lyme disease to, you know, endometriosis to spinal cord injuries to tarlov cysts. And patients are getting better faster. Okay. So big, honey, big giant hug to you. You are not alone. Everybody out there, this is my final message. You are not alone. No shame, no blame. You are an anatomical mystery to be solved. And let's see if we can get there. And one in one angel, if you email me, icnetwork at mac.com, I will email you our book, IC 101. It's not just a bladder disease. I will email that to you for free. I absolutely would love to do that for you. Okay. So my email address, icnetwork at Mac. That's short for Macintosh computer. So M is in Mary, A is in Apple, C is in Charlie.com. Icnetwork at Mac.com. Pop me an email. I will be happy to send this to you so that you know you might you might get some new ideas. We just want to open some doors. We want to give you some hope. You got a UTI, you got to get that fixed. The whole ANA thing, that's a whole nother mystery. And uh, I hope we get some answers from, I hope you get some answers for that soon. All right. Big giant hug to everybody. Love you all. Wish you well. I will see you either on Thursday on Facebook when I do, I usually try to do a stream on Thursday for Facebook only. I couldn't do it last week. I was too busy. Um, and then next Sunday. And again, I'm always available if you want to reach out to me. Uh, but in the end, you got to read my friends. You can do this. I wish you well. Be well, everybody. Have a good evening. I hope you sleep well tonight. All right. Goodbye, YouTube. See you later. All right, Facebook.